Well, all very, very sad about Oscar Pereira, Paul. Well, it just goes to prove that, uh, you know, the, the sport of professional cycling is a very dangerous sport. And uh, as I said at the start of the climb, there are no safety nets uh, for the riders, especially on mm. some of these very dangerous and technical descents. And uh, especially on a descent like that, Phil, when you come into a corner and uh, it's a hairpin bend and you touch the brakes wrongly, and then the next minute it's very difficult to control. Well, it's been a very, very sad race in many ways for the Case de Palm because they came here with a team, a terrific team, to try and win the Tour de France. I think Valverde's lost his chance, and he lost it with uh, when he was dropped on the Tourmalet on stage 10 on the way to Otakam. And then he had chain trouble, and he lost more time on the climb of Otakam. And now he's seen a man who looked to be showing very good form, Oscar Pereiro. He fell from top to bottom on that bend. Yeah, the funny thing is, uh, just the other day you were mentioning about the performances of Oscar Pereira in the Tour de France, and uh, he was always, apart from his victory in 2006, locked into a 10th place in the overall classification. However, the bit more information coming through, Phil, uh, on his crash, that he never lost uh, consciousness at all, so mm. fortunately I think he's going to be all right after that crash. It's just uh, sad to see a man disappearing from the Tour de France uh, after an accident like that. Yeah, it's really sad. Uh, this is Danny Page at the back, chatting with the Garmin Chipotle team car here. They're all going very well, it's uncanny this, isn't it, uh, because this is exactly what Christian van der Velde said he wanted at the start today. Uh, one or two teammates in the league group so they could wait for him later. Well, he's got one in the league group, and at the moment, at 16 and a half minutes, they might still be in the lead when they start the finishing climb. Well, I have a gut feeling they will, because at the moment, nobody's come to the front to assist uh, Silence Lotto in the pacemaking, and they really have no reason to chase. Yeah. A long day in the saddle for everyone this afternoon. We're still looking at uh, a good two hours to go to the finish line for the, the men in the main field as they make their way through this long valley road. This long valley road takes them away from the bottom of the Col d'Agnelle, right the way down to the town of Cuneo, where the riders will spend a rest day tomorrow. And that comes in at 136 kilometres into the race. And then at around about 40 kilometres after the town of Cuneo, once they've circumnavigated Cuneo at least, they will then start the final climb of the day. Well, 179, well, 108 kilometres have now been covered, 75 kilometres to go. Bunch are leaving themselves a big target, but they're not interested. It could even be that those boys up front might even win the stage. They have to win by 53 minutes, which is impossible, uh, to give a yellow jersey off the shoulders of Cadell Evans. So I would say it's clear now uh, that the battle of the heads of the race is all going to come mano a mano on the last climb of the day. And that should be a terrific ascent. It will be a terrific ascent. Uh, but it may well have been left a little bit too late for the Italians to get their glory here, Phil, because 16 minutes is going to be a very difficult gap to pull back. And uh, at the moment is really airing on the advantage of the leading group of four riders. Botcher off here, number 83, coming back. I think he will have been a little bit concerned by his performance on the climb a little earlier because he really is regarded as a man uh, to ride high in the overall classification for Credit Agricole, and, and normally he's a very good climber. Yeah, it's interesting. Botchinov has got back. He was quite early off the back on the climb, and uh, we don't know where the, bouts, where the, the whereabouts of Robbie McEwen, but if he's got back, then he'll probably make his way up to the front uh, to try and do a little bit more work with Silence Lotto. Now, exactly what you said, Paul, the Italians have no one in the break, They've displaced Lotto, so they're trying to get this race closed down so they have an Italian up front. They're going to have a long, hard chase, I'll tell you, Phil, if they want to pull back that 17-minute 17 17 leading group. Because That's about uh, the biggest we've had the whole tour, isn't it? I think it is pretty yeah. close to being yeah. the largest breakaway gap we've had since the start of the tour, and it's going to be very hard to pull back into the fold, but the Italians are proud men, and uh, they don't get that much of a chance to ride the Tour de France on Italian soil. So this afternoon... Uh, they may well see some assistance coming from Liquigas, but it's obvious that Damiano Cunigo Phil, wants to win the stage this afternoon. Well, the peloton is about 11 kilometres from the feed zone. Of course, the leaders have gone through there well and truly. And at their 17-minute gap here, they're going to be something like uh, 13 kilometres in the lead right now over the peloton. That is a big gap, and it's a valley road now with just the corrugations here as we race across Italy towards the finish. Now, this is the most aggressive riders, that'll be uh, uh, Gutierrez, yeah, yeah, who's now coming back as well. 
Yep. Jose Ivan Gutierrez. He was in the, in the lead uh, on the road into Dini Le Bat, and he's making his way back into the main field. You can just about see his red numbers uh, underneath his racing cape there, indicating that he was the most aggressive rider of the stage yesterday. That's a big main field, and despite the fact a lot of riders were dropped on the slopes of the Col Daniel, they've most of them been able to make their way back into the main field onto the descent. Maybe caused by the moment of truce when they saw uh, Oscar Pereiro uh, on the side of the road in what was a very nasty crash. And it appears to us that exactly what happened to Oscar Pereiro was he was coming into that hairpin bend and uh, he lost it a fraction when he touched his brakes and slid on the slippery road and uh, hit the crash barrier, went over the top and dropped down uh, four or five metres. Uh, he's been taken to hospital, has been looked after by the medical assistance on the Tour de France here uh, he never lost any consciousness at all but it appears that he may have suffered some kind of uh, break either to his shoulder or to his leg or even to both we'll find that out later on in the day and uh, hopefully he will be okay and he will recover, he'll recover before the end of the season we're into the town now of uh, Frasino and that's 86 kilometers to go and that is for the uh, main field who've still yet to get themselves to the feeding station at Mele. By the way, uh, just if you are a, an aficionado of Italian food, the uh, food in this town, the speciality of Frasino, is actually ravioli. So, on the front end now, it's uh, Lamprey, the teammates of Damiano Cunigo, dedicating themselves to uh, Johan van Sommen, uh, the big tour rider teammate of Cadell Evans trying to get a little bit of information from uh, race radio to figure out just exactly whether or not he needs to come to the front and help these guys out Leif Hoster just over there to the left hand side he's another good strong man for silence Lotto and this is when you don't want to be a workhorse on any team Paul when the boss says I want the breakaway court and you're looking to bridge a gap of a quarter of an hour that's gonna hurt Psychologically, it's really tough to have to do that, Phil, uh, when you see that time gap, 70 minutes, because you can understand the amount of pain that you've got to drag your body through to try and pull that breakaway back. And the fact is, you've only got three riders from Team Lamper on the front end of the main field who are actually working uh, to do that job to try and pull it all back. As we look here at Sebastian Langer, he's going back to the team car. And the three men from Lamprey doing the work on the front field are chasing four riders who currently are all basically pretty much sharing the pacemaker. Yeah. Lang in the polka dot jersey there, king of the mountain. He's lost that lead, by the way, on the climb today of the Col d'Angel, but he won't be too worried. He's gone to his teammate for the moment. And there's all every chance he might regain it. And these are the four leaders. Egoi Martinez. Simon Gerrans are looking pretty comfortable. It's uh, interesting to see, Phil, that every time you look at these guys, they're, they're eating. And that's really an important thing to do on a, on a mountain stage. It's a lot easier to do on today's stage because once they've gone over the big mountain, they've got this flat 60-kilometre section in the middle. But on the stages that are coming up after the rest day, it's even more difficult to do because if you're not going uphill, you're going downhill. And it's on days like there that sometimes professional riders make the mistake of not keeping their energy levels topped up by keeping a little bit of food coming into the system every 10 to 15 minutes. Well, they're looking like very determined men, these. They're certainly not looking like men who are going to wait for anybody today. There's Simon Gerrans getting that food down inside him. They must have tremendous indigestion to attract these boys. Well, another thing that's important as well is for guys like the, the, three, li the three guys who are in front there of Danny Pate are uh, riders who are reputed as climbers, and they usually have a much lower body fat level than uh, riders who are sprinters, so they have a much keener interest of, in keeping themselves topped up with energy as well because they've got no reserves to eat into. Well, this is the second sprint of the day and the last one at Rosana. Comes at 69 kilometres to go. Again, I don't think we're going to see any sprint whatsoever because they're not interested in the points for the green jersey nor the few euros on offer. It was Martinez, Arieta and Pate was the order last time out. Gerrans wasn't with them at the first sprint. He caught them up, of course. And just uh, looks as though it might be Igor and Martinez. He swings off. They're working very equal together, these four boys, and that's a bad sign for the peloton. Four different teams represented, four teams that won't try to chase down these riders. It's absolutely perfect tactics for Christian van der Velde because 
Pate is up here, and he is back there, and he's got no excuse to do anything but watch. Well, it's nice to see that all of the towns that the Tour de France is going through, Phil, on its way to the finish in Prato mm. Novoso, have decked themselves out in yellow. There's yellow bunting in nearly all of the towns, there's yellow flags, and even on the ride, the ride up to the finish line here, there were lots of yellow balloons as well. The uh, PA Montoise people are very pleased to see the Tour in a region it very rarely visits, and yet it's very close to France. 17 minutes and 10 seconds now. Not making much of an impression, really. Uh, not at all, because you can see the, the guys from Team Lamprey have uh, pretty much switched off. Uh, there's not a serious chase on the front end of the main field here, Phil. And I, I have a feeling today they've, they've missed out. I, I'm starting to believe that that leading group of four riders are going to, to duke out the challenge to win the stage themselves. Even if they start the climb with uh, five or six minutes advantage, because three of those riders in that leading group are very good climbers, I think they'll survive. It makes you wonder because they're giving them a heck of a run. In, in the old days, of course, we saw stages won by 20 minutes and 25 minutes, but in modern day Tour de France riding, very rarely does that happen. Just looking down now at the small uh, little villages here, you might just notice the, the rooftops there, the tiles in this part of the world are made out of huge slabs of stone and uh, the roofs must weigh an absolute ton to keep them uh, nice and cool and warm in the, cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Lamprey now starting to turn up the pressure just a little bit and it's an ideal situation this Phil for Cadell Evans he just has to sit back and his team doesn't really have to chase. No, he's in a lovely position Got his nice warm top on. Life couldn't be sweeter right now. Everybody that matters is here around him. And there's a breakaway 17-10 taking all the pressure off. And there's nobody up there can take the lead in the Tour de France today. Cadell Evans uh, so far spending a great opening day. There's the Jamaican flag there, wasn't it? Uh, looks like it, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, you can see. a Jamaican in the race, have we? Uh, not yet. OK. Won't be long, I think, the way the world is uh, catching up with the sport of cycling. Well, Johan van Sommeren moving up to the front in second position. Uh, Leif Hoster is uh, the rider who uh, spends an awful lot of time riding very close to Cadell Evans, and the reason for that is to keep a close eye on the man who uh, wears the yellow jersey as overall leader in case he has any kind of mechanical problem or in case he simply needs to stop at the side of the road. Confirmation of the sprint there. Gerens uh, getting that sprint ahead of uh, Danny Pate and Jose Luis Arrieta, and that's at Rosana at 68 and a half kilometers to go. Well, the crash officially, uh, now we're getting it on the computer, what uh, happened at 80 kilometers. Um, the Pereira apparently never lost consciousness, which is a very good thing, and he's now on his way to hospital. He has a suspected fractured shoulder and a suspected broken femur. And so that's a broken leg, effectively, of course, and... Um, well, let's hope he's OK, but that, I would think, will end his season if all those injuries are confirmed. Big Leif Hoster. And uh, going through the feeding station, uh, this is a, an opportunity, <laughs> Phil, for all the guys to get their excess clothing off and pass it over to the uh, soigneurs at the side of the road. Oh, that was very clever. He just got that down and snatched his bag at the same time. Good reactions. Slow down, will you? Just wait <laughs> for me. This is a little bit of a disorganisation going through the feeding station here. As this one rider from Lamprey uh, wants to uh, keep the pressure as high as possible. This is nice at the back. Always dangerous when they take these little musettes. In fact, one or two's got the common sense to stop there. <laughs> you see, one or two riders were very laden down there with their uh, clothes and they uh, stopped at the side of the road to offload those by the team Swanyers. And that's why uh, the rest of the guys from Lamprey there were just a little bit concerned about the fact that their teammate had kept the pressure on at the front end and created a little bit of disorganisation. 66 kilometres to go, and that puts them at around about uh, 45 kilometres to the bottom of the climb. And they're going to have to do a serious chase here this afternoon if they want to pull this all back for their man, Damiano Cunigo. Cunigo really wanted to win this this afternoon. But to letting that group of four riders get off the front end and four very good climbers was maybe not the best tactic. A great tactic for Cadell Evans, because as far as Cadell Evans is concerned, it's up to the other teams now to chase. 
Not one of those riders in that leading group of four is dangerous to him at all. The closest rider is Egoi Martinez, who is more than 50 minutes behind in the overall classification. Cadell has to watch riders like Frank Schleck and Christian van der Velde, who's only 38 seconds behind him at the start of the... Well, the main field now have just managed to get themselves through the feeding station and they're still looking to try and bridge a gap of 17 minutes to the four leaders who are off the front end of the main field. But the big news really is that rather sad accident that happened to the 200, 2006 winner of the Tour de France, Oscar Pereiro. He went down on the descent, he crashed rather dramatically and in fact uh, went over a crash barrier and fell down four or five metres onto the road below and has been taken away from the race in the uh, ambulance where they are believing he may well have fractured his shoulder and quite possibly have broken his leg as well. So the 2006 winner of the Tour de France is now out of the Tour while the race goes on and heads down towards the town of Cuneo which is uh, not far away from the start of the final climb of the day, the Prateo Novoso. And the climb up here to Prateo Novoso is a very difficult climb. Uh, the main field have just gone through the feeding station and have lost themselves on the day so far around about 17 minutes on a leading group of four riders. In fact, uh, the race here has split up a fraction, and that's because we've just gone through the feeding station and Team Lamprey are all over the front of the main field. Now, the reason Lamprey are the front of the main field is because they want their man, Damiano Cunigo, in with a chance of getting a crack at victory here this afternoon. And strangely enough, on the day that the race is heading into Italy, and we're currently on Italian soil, of the four leaders at the front of the bike race, not one of those men is from Italy. Back of the group here, just looking here at David Miller, number 198. He'll be looking after his teammate uh, Christian van der Velde, the American rider on that uh, Garmin Chipotle team, lies in third place in the overall classification. There's the yellow jersey at the front end of the main field, Cadell Evans, and uh, I should think a little bit of panic on board there in the main field because uh, there's a serious split has appeared. Schumacher hasn't missed out, he's the rider in the pale blue jersey, just moving forward. But looking a little bit further back, there's a, a big split in the main field. Looking down the split here, Paul, a little bit serious because I think Frank Schleck has missed it. Well, I don't think it's uh, that serious. It's a split that happened going through the feeding station. It was caused by the fact that Team Lamprey went through the feeding station, Phil, at uh, maximum speed and didn't slow down at all. And there's a bit of finger waving going on here. Fabian Wegman is shouting up to Bernard Cole as they drive on. And uh, Stefan Schumacher's made the right split. Here comes the charge behind. It's going to all come back together again, but they weren't expecting this. There's Cadell Evans. He's got his team around him. Popovich looking after him with the dark glasses on. Well, the important thing is uh, that's another good reason for sitting at the front end of the main field because the guys in the back will have had a, a little bit of a scare because of that split, but they will also have had to use a little bit of extra energy to pull themselves back up to the yellow jersey of Cadell Evans. And in fact, it's the men from Uskatel Uskadi in the orange jerseys there. Unless, of course, that's Rabobank, because one man who will have missed out, of course, is Denny Menchov. Menchov, Frank Sleck, I think Carlos Sastre weren't paying attention, and now they've got to do a little extra work that wasn't part of the scenario just now. The chase is helping too. 16.43, it's come back from 17.10. Cadell just getting on with having his meal while everybody else is looking after him. This is, this is in fact, Sastre at the back here. Well, he doesn't seem to be panning at all. I think uh, he may well have missed out on taking on board his bag, his food bag, which is why he's gone back to the team car to get himself topped up with some energy bars. Frank Schlepp coming back as well. So they're relying on the race to regroup, and it will, of course, but it's still a little bit of an uncomfortable riding moment for some of these riders. Frank Schlepp, red, white and blue, the champion of Luxembourg. He says he's dreaming of winning on the Alpe d'Huez, but I wonder if he's dreaming about grabbing a yellow jersey by the end of today's stage, because he's only one second off the overall lead of Cadell Evans, and one second, Phil, at the top of a mountain top finish like this is really not very much at all. No, uh, but if Cadell is right there, I would let Frank Schleck ride away and get the yellow jersey. That would be the best thing, because that would uh, confuse the tactics of Team CSC because they would feel themselves uh, just a little bit obliged to keep the yellow jersey. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's pretty impressive. I mean, how do they do that when they're at ground level? The wheels are perfectly round. Well, um, sorry to take the magic away from you, yes. but the way they do that kind of stuff, it's actually done by GPS in this day and age. Oh, how boring. <laughs> you look at me now. 
I know you thought it was very artistic. I it's did. Uh, planned out by computer and then done by GPS settings. These four leaders, I think if they want to start to dream about winning the stage here this afternoon, Phil, they're going to have to start the climb with a good five minutes lead over the front end of the main field because they will lose time once we start the climb up to Prato Nervoso. It's a climb of around about 11 kilometres, but it's not really a very steep climb. It's an average gradient of around about 7%. Well, we continue in the Valleyita Valley. We're sure to be leaving this valley as we head now towards the town of Vanesca. Vanesca, 74 kilometres to go. Speed of those cars indicating this race is beginning to pick up the tempo. Yes, we've come down to uh, a lower part of the race so after having gone over the high spot at the Col de l'Angel and the high spot was 2,700 metres. We're now down to around about 500 metres as we go down here now through the Vareta Valley. Uh, the main town that we're going through at the moment is Vanaska. This is Frank Schleck at the back end of the main field. And obviously, I think with a little bit of panic field going through that feed zone there, these riders from Seam CSC weren't able to take on board their drinks and uh, their feed bags. Well, temperature in the valley, it's shot up now from uh, 10 degrees on the mountains. It's 27 degrees down here at the moment, which is about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, I'm just listening to somebody shouting in my ears here from the race radio. Somebody got in the way. Well, Frank Schleck there, he's just loading up all of his food and then he'll go back up. That's Kim Anderson, former yellow jersey himself for the Tour de France from Denmark. He was passing out chocolate bars. Yep, he used to ride for the, uh, the co-op Mercia team uh, alongside uh, a very good British manager, and that would be John Herity, who looks after one of the top British teams now. This is the other of the Schleck brothers. The two Schleck brothers, they seem almost, uh, although they're separated by a couple of years in age, they're almost like twins in the main field. They ride along side by side when they're out training, and even in the bunch, they're never really separated by very much at all. No, it really is a, an absolute case of brotherly love. They're no, never jealous of each other's performances. They're very much the first people to congratulate one another, and, uh, and they help one another too. And uh, it was funny there that Andy was also at the back of the race when Frank was. But look at the speed now, 16.10. They've taken a minute off the lead uh, since the feeding station. So this is a very serious chase. Goodness knows what damage is going to do the Lamprey riders on the front. Uh, but they very seriously want this breakaway back. Well, if they can knock off uh, two minutes uh, for every 10 kilometres over the next 40 kilometres, they'll bring it back into a manageable amount to try and start nurturing uh, the belief that they can win the stage. But I still think uh, if they give those riders in the leading group a five-minute start at the foot of the final climb of the day, one of those leading four, four is actually going to win the race because they are good climbers. Three of those riders in that leading group, Phil, are excellent climbers. Martinez, Gerens and Arietta. They're all reputed for their climbing abilities. That's a few climbers there on the back row of the uh, hillside. Here they come. Oh, come on, they need a little bit more acceleration at the motorbike here. Almost clipped the back wheel, but they are really in exciting mood now. They drive on. Just the Silas Lotto boys accelerate. There's Stuart O'Grady and their fellow Australian, but on a rival team, Cadell Evans, taking the wheel of Stuart. Which is a pretty tough position, doesn't it? Because O'Grady will be thinking about victory in the Tour de France for either Frank Schleck or Carlos Sastre. Mm. And if uh, that does happen to be the, the way, he will be stealing the victory away from his own country. Yes. So, for the first time, it uh, sneaked inside of the 16-minute mark, and these riders now know that they're going to have to work hard over the next 50 kilometres. Yeah, they've got around about uh, well, 48 kilometres to the foot of the final climb of the day. And that final climb of the day takes the riders up for 11 kilometres up to the ski resort here of Prato Nervoso. The climb really starts in earnest once they go through the small town of uh, Merolio. And it's a climb uh, with an average gradient to begin with of not really very much at all, around about four and a half to five and a half percent. But as they get towards the summit of the climb, the last half of the climb from kilometer seven to kilometer 11 is all pretty much above seven percent in gradient. But the average gradient for the whole climb is only 6.9 percent. So not really a massive climb, just a little bit of an hors d'oeuvre, I would have to say, of the Alps. Uh, but that will change, I'm sure, a little bit later on. So Lamprey now, it's a tall order to try and pull back 16 minutes. 
the kilometers ticking off uh, and an average speed uh, of 23 and a half mile an hour because of the long descent it's starting to creep up to a respectable average speed now as we race towards the last mountain of the day 58 kilometers to go boy look at the length now of the peloton of the tour de france well, uh, looking at the front end of the main field, 73% of the work in the last uh, 10 minutes has been done by Team Lamprey and 27% has been done by Silence Lotto. It's on a day like this, Phil, that you don't want to be a domestique and you've got to bang your head against a brick wall to try and pull back a 15 and three quarter minute breakaway lead. As we gaze out across the Alps here to locate the race, there are four leaders up there. The sun is out now. It's gone up to 27 degrees Celsius. It was 10 on top of the Col d'Angel, and the breakaway is now coming back. It's still an awful long way ahead, though, and it got a maximum lead of over 17 minutes, and it's now down to just about 16 minutes. And wherever you go, there are signs saying, long live the Tour de France. These are the workhorses of Damiano Cunigo. The Lamprey riders have been told to chase the breakdown. Well, the town of Rosana salutes the Tour, and that's 68 and a half kilometers to go for the main field. But it's 57 kilometers to go for the leading group of four riders. It's certainly not one of those days, uh, but actually, strangely enough, all of a sudden, there's a couple of riders from Team CSC have moved up to the front end of the main field. Nicky Sorensen there, the champion of Denmark, and just behind him, Stewie O'Grady. So maybe we are about to be treated to a rip-roaring chase to try and pull back the four leaders. Well, this is most interesting because we thought we might they might use CSC riders once the climb started to break up and then try and uh, crack Cadell Evans's uh, silence lotto team, but they put men near the front already. 15.45 as they went through the sprint point there. Gerrans won there, by the way, from Australia. Danny Pate of the USA was second, and Arietta was third. The four breakaways leading by 15 and three-quarter minutes at this point. It's a, a long way to go, and they'll be gambling on the fact that they can hold on to a big chunk of their advantage. They built up their advantage to... It was actually almost 18 minutes when they got to the feeding station, then all of a sudden Team Lampre decided, right, enough is enough, we need to get this back into the fold because our man from Italy, the Little Prince is his nickname, Damiano Cunigo, certainly wants to try and plead the Defossi. And, Phil, every time we get a chance to see the climb, it appears as if half of the population of Piemonte has turned out here to come and see the Tour de France on Italian soil. Well, wait till you see the crowd on the finishing climb, the Prato Nervoso. It is huge as they will come all the way up to an absolute corridor of noise today. And these four riders might yet be the first onto the slopes at 56 kilometres from the finish. They're only about 25 miles from the start of the climb. Yeah, that's the difficult thing, I think, that the main field has to bargain with this afternoon. The fact is, they're running out of time to chase. I just caught sight there of Robbie McEwen. So McEwen must have made a seriously big daredevil descent field to get himself back into the main field. And CSC now are very keen to come and help out to do the pacemaking. That's well, Stewie O'Grady. Well, if you're just joining us, by the way, Mark Cavendish of the United Kingdom, the four-time stage winner of this tour, didn't start today. He's gone home to prepare for the Olympics. Two riders who have, have retired is Mark Renshaw of Australia, Stein de Volder of Belgium, and we have witnessed a, a rather a, a terrible crash between from Oscar Pereiro, and he collided apparently with Robbie Hunter, uh, but Pereiro came over the guardrail and dropped about 12 feet to the part of the road below which had turned underneath him, and he's gone to hospital with a suspected fractured shoulder and a broken leg. Uh, but never lost consciousness, and his uh, life-threatening injuries are certainly not involved. Well, that's uh, good news, I think, for everybody who follows the sport of professional cycling. Julian Dean there in the black and white for Team Garmin Chipotle. They've got a lot of work to do this afternoon, Phil, because they've got some serious responsibility themselves. In fact, uh, despite the fact they've got Danny Pate in that leading group of four riders, they've also got Christian van der Velde in third place in the overall classification. And there's Christian van der Velde there, number 191. 15.22, it's coming down. It was 15.45 a few moments ago. The chase is working. Yes, the chase is definitely working, but it's going to be a long, hard chase to try and pull back a quarter of an hour in 55 kilometres. I'm not really convinced yet that it's going to happen. Unless, of course, that leading group of four riders starts to weaken, but they don't seem to be weakening at all just yet. This is Danny Pate. 
Well, he started something today, Paul. Let's hope he can finish it off. This is the one man in the four who's never ridden the Tour de France before, former under-23 world champion on the road. And the other three are pretty experienced in the Tour de France. Look at the crowd here. It really is phenomenal. The Italians love their cycling, that's for absolute certain. And the fact that they get a chance to see the Tour de France on Italian soil is why they've turned out in their absolute numbers. But as you've said a couple of times, it really is incredible the number of people on this final climb of the day. And on top of the mountain, the weather is looking better than it's looked the whole day. The sun is out, it's all looking very pleasant. Everybody, it seems, has got the stock issue of yellow today in Germany. All of the buntings are yellow, there's yellow balloons in all the villages, because we saw this last night when we drove to the finishing line. Now the jockeys have got themselves uh, yellow tops, and they've done a real good job in this part of Italy. Yeah, I think the price of yellow T-shirts actually went up over the last <laughs> couple of days. Probably what about the umbrellas? Left. How about the umbrellas? Brilliant. <laughs> and they're obviously paint as well because they, well, they've got a bit of that too. Bit of a tight fit through the panel, uh, through the corridor of the people here, but they're through. And the gap is at 15-15. I can't see this coming back, you know. Personally, I can't either, even though we are getting uh, assistance for a number of teams coming to the front end of the peloton, including Team CSC and, of course, Team Lamprey. But I'm not sure they've got the firepower to reduce the deficit of a quarter of an hour. So, going around the corner, Nicky Sorensen now negotiating that corner, followed by the rider from Lamprey, Stereo O'Grady in the white jersey there in third position. O'Grady looking pretty good here this afternoon. Um, these guys are probably actually just, uh, as far as Team CSC are concerned, they're maybe not even thinking about the stage victory here this afternoon. What they've got on the back of their minds is uh, just trying to toughen the race up for the final ascent to see whether or not they can surprise Cadell Evans and get the yellow jersey away from him. So, just looking at the main field as they um, meander away, they get themselves around that corner. I think really they're not chasing to, to catch that leading group. They're really pretty much thinking about uh, trying to toughen the race up for the final climb. Well, these are the four leaders now looking at just four, 52 kilometres to go to the finish and they've still got around about a quarter of an hour advantage over the front end of the main field. But there are different teams coming to the front end of the peloton right now. I'm not convinced that they're going to pull these riders back into the fold before the end because I have a feeling the only reason Team CSC have gone up to the front end of the peloton is to toughen the race up so they can, in fact, have a, a serious attempt at trying to get the overall lead away from Cadell Evans, bearing in mind that Frank Schleck is just one second behind the Australian in the overall classification. These riders, I reckon, uh, with a, a five-minute start at the, at the bottom of the climb, are more, more likely to survive, because uh, three of the riders in this group are very good climbers. The man on the front, Egoi Martinez, a winner of the Tour de l'Avenir. The man on the back, Jose Luis Arieta, a winner of a stage of the Vuelta a España. Simon Gerens, himself uh, a very good climber. I'm not so sure on the climbing ability of uh, Danny Pates, the American rider there in the black and white shorts for Team Garmin Chipotle, a teammate of David Miller, but of course he has got a good pedigree in the fact that he was a former under-23 world champion in the road race. And they don't look like a, a group of riders who are actually losing any impetus at all. They're still pedalling with great urgency, they're still keeping their average speed in that leading breakaway at around about 45 kilometres an hour. Whereas in the main field here, they've probably lifted up their average speed to around about uh, 50 kilometres an hour, which means they can pull back around about five kilometres in the last hour of the race, and five kilometres is only seven and a half to eight minutes. And so that would leave the leading group of four still with an advantage of four or five minutes at the line. This is O'Grady now. Followed by one, two, three, four riders from Lamprey. The next rider back there in the red and white jersey is the champion of Denmark, Nicky Sorensen. Yaroslav Popovic occasionally popping his head around there to see what's going on. There's Julian Dean in the black and white over on the left-hand side. Cadell Evans just sitting there, just waiting. He knows he's going to get attacked on this final climb of the day. And he knows he's going to have to probably do the majority of the chasing himself. He will rely, I think, on Yaroslav Popovic. The rider from Ukraine, who finished uh, inside of the top ten in the Tour de France and uh, a couple of years ago won himself the white jersey competition for the best young rider. 
pretty sad of the accident that happened to Oscar Pereira just a little while ago. Oscar Pereira went down very dramatically on a descent. He's been taken away to hospital with a suspected uh, broken shoulder and a broken leg as well. But he didn't lose consciousness at all throughout his crash, so uh, not a life-threatening injury. But sad to see the winner of the 2006 Tour de France having to retire from the event. You can see, if you look at that long line of riders uh, coming out of the back of the main field there, that the pressure is really on at the front end of the main field. O'Grady doing a lot of pacemaking, uh, giving a little bit of assistance to the riders from Team Lamprey, but that gap is not really coming down very fast at all. Just looking around, uh, it's still uh, O'Grady going around the corner there, looking pretty good. Well, just having a quick look now at the speed of the main field. It's 14 minutes and 50 seconds, and the reason they're starting to turn up the pressure in the main field is because they want to pull these four riders back into the fold. But they're on a fairly easy part of the, uh, the course here. This is the fat, flattest part of the course, and they are looking uh, to take themselves down to the finish line. The little indicator there showing that the breakaway is going to succeed. Gives them the, the little uh, red, the little green flag, which is uh, green for success of the breakaway. Uh, down to 14 and a half minutes. Uh, Gerin's uh, got a win in the early part of the year for Credit Agricole, and that was uh, the second stage of the Criterium International. This is the small town of uh, Busca, which the riders are going through, and it's right at the edge of the plain of Cuneo, and not far away from the Myra River. In fact, there have been a, a huge number of archaeological discoveries in this part of the world, and the town dates back to the 10th century. Just uh, a quick look there at the Church of the Holy Trinity, right down there in the heart of town. This church uh, has been kept, and there's a shrine in here dedicated to the Madonna. Well, the leading group of four riders uh, are losing a little bit of time, but I don't think they're losing time fast enough now as they go inside at 49 kilometres to go to the finish. That should take them uh, around about an hour and 20 minutes because uh, the last 11 kilometres of the climb, uh, the race is uphill to the ski resort of Prato Nevoso. This is Egoi Martinez in the orange jersey of Uscatel Uscari. Danny Pate, 199, a teammate of David Miller on the Garmin Chipotle team from the United States of America. Former under-23 world champion. Riding uh, the Tour de France for the first time in his career is probably wondering to himself, what am I doing here this afternoon? Simon Gerrans from Australia. He's already had a couple of wins so far. In fact, one just before the start of the Tour de France in the Route du Sud, which is in the southern... Oh, there's a crash. There's a number of riders gone down here very dramatically around this corner. All it takes is a little bit of grease on the road, and they go down. They've gone down on the left-hand side, and on the right, there's all kinds of riders down on the ground. It's a big crash. There's probably 20 riders gone down there. There's a couple of riders gone down from uh, Uscatel Uscadi. One of the riders who's gone down there, Julian Dean, has gone down, I believe, and that's what's being announced on race radio. And uh, just having a look, a couple of riders there from, uh, looks like Alessandro Balan, the tall rider there from Team Lamprey. Rabobank, Garmin Chipotle uh, taking the wheel out, looking to see if they can fix. Van der Velde has gone down. Christian Van der Velde. Christian van der Vel has gone down there. Damiano Cunigo. No, that's not Cunigo. That's uh, number 72 went down there. And that is uh, Alessandro Balan over on uh, the right-hand side of the road. So, a little bit of chaos at the back end of the main field, and look how that happened. There's a rider at the front there went down, and that was one of the riders from uh, Team Columbia. And then once you're uh, in a situation like that, you just touch your brakes, and then a whole stack of riders go down. Just touching your brakes on a greasy surface like this, and there's nothing you can do at all. Apart from the man on the left-hand side who made the best operation there, he was looking for the uh, easy, soft landing. So, slowing down again. Uh, they're allowing most of the riders to get themselves back into the main field here. They've uh, shut off the pacemaking a little bit at the front. 
Stewie O'Grady looking over his shoulder. Uh, Andy Schleck, Fabian Cancellara. Just goes to show that uh, just a little bit of dampness. Let's have a look at that one more timer. You can see one rider just touching his brakes and everybody behind panics. You hear the, the screeching of scraping metal and he put the brakes on just a little bit too hard. Then all of a sudden, bang, and you're down. And it was quite amazing. It was almost uh, in stereo action because it was on both sides of that roundabout. And race radio telling me that uh, all of the riders who went down there, in fact, have managed to get themselves up and uh, they're riding back at the front end of the main field. That was Damiano Cunigo, so he wasn't involved in the crash. It was, in fact, his teammate Alessandro Balan, as I'd thought. So a little bit of uh, a slowing down now, and that should give uh, most of the guys who crashed a chance to get themselves back into the main field. I'm pretty certain that uh, Christian van der Velde will get himself uh, back into the pack quite easily. Just goes to show, Phil, that uh, the crashes can happen either at the front or at the back of the main field, and especially when it's a little bit greasy like that, all you have to do is touch your brakes and you're down. Well, those sort of accidents happen in, on the freeways in, in motor car crashes when you, you rubber neck the other side, but I've never seen it before in a Tour de France. Um, race Radio was saying that Van der Velde was down. I must confess I couldn't see him, uh, but either way, everybody, it seems, is OK, up and riding. And now we'll see if they come back because it looks as though the peloton this time has applied a little bit of pressure at the front. Well, they slowed down a fraction, I think, to allow most of yeah. the riders to get back on. It was uh, crackled over race radio that Christian van der Velde had gone down. Certainly Julian Dean was down. Definitely. I saw Dean in his black and white jersey, the uh, champion of New Zealand. Alessandro Balan went down. Uh, the race uh, caption went up to say it was Damiano Cunigo, but he did not go down. I saw him sitting at the front end of the main field, the Vincenzo Nibali is the leader of the best young rider competition and the best placed Italian in the overall classification. Mm. He too must have been on the ground. Yeah, he's coming back. The boys from Rabobank are orange. This is Mario Ertz here, number two. And the right-hand men of Cadell Evans, of course. And the Liqui Gas rider is Murillo Fischer, the Brazilian in the lime green colours. He's back. Meanwhile, business as usual for Vincenti Garcia da Costa. He's dropped back for a lot of bottles, and I don't think he fell. 45 minutes, uh, 14 minutes and 24 seconds. Uh, I think really the pressure being put at the front end of the main field now by Team CSC, Phil, is not to chase it down the four leaders. It's more to make the race tough so that we can have a serious assault of the final climb of the day. Well, a lot of riders now believe that breakaway is going to be successful. I mean, if they've got any like five or six minutes at the bottom, they will not catch him. There's Cunigo. You said he didn't crash, but I'm not no. so sure. I'd I do, he doesn't look black and he doesn't look uh, damaged no, uh, at all. A little I bit of know. dirt. There's a little bit of a mark there for him. When you've gone down, and got up very quickly. Yeah. But uh, those crashes at high speed are usually, uh, if you can have a, a decent crash, those are probably the best ones to have, Phil, because <laughs> normally what happens is you slide rather than fall heavily. Yeah. But it, it must have been oil or something on that roundabout because it, the roads are perfectly dry. Yeah. It, all it takes is uh, a touching of the brakes and uh, the panic and the noise from the sound of scraping steel crates causes a lot of riders behind to apply the brakes too savagely. One man not involved in that at all is just up on the right-hand side of the main field there. You can see uh, Cadell Evans in the yellow jersey. He's surrounded by his faithful guards uh, at the back end of the group. This looks like Matteo Tosato. Tosato. Alongside Nibali, you can see that he did go down. He's got a little bit of blackness on his jersey. He's got to figure himself out. He's, uh, I don't think he doesn't look too injured at all. He's going to go back to the um, race car, or is he going to go to the, the race doctor just to see what the situation... There's Julian Dean, so he's back up, uh, coming up as well. 196 is Trent Lowe. Young Aussie on uh, Team Slipstream. You can see the... Uh, Ripped his shorts a little bit. He's uh, got a slight injury to his elbow, but I don't think he went down too hard. They're not uh, hard enough for it to be a serious injury. 64, Murillo Fisher. So you can see here that most of the uh, most of the sprinters managed to get themselves back into the main field on a day when uh, they obviously wondered what was going to happen. So the race is splitting up again uh, around one of these roundabouts. Look at all of the yellow bunting, uh, which has been uh, prominent in nearly all of the towns we've been through here, as if everybody is celebrating the arrival and the passage of the Tour de France, the Giro di Francia, onto Italian soil. 
the four leaders didn't have anything to worry about at all as uh, they are still holding on to a massive chunk of their advantage 43 kilometers Borgo San Giepi and uh, 14 minutes the gap they're never going to see these riders till they're in the showers tonight that's for sure Paul no, definitely, they're not going to pull back 14 minutes and 20 seconds in 43 kilometres, even though the last 11 are uphill, because the three riders uh, in first, second, third place at the moment are very good climbers in their own right. The only man whose uh, climbing ability I question a fraction, really, is Danny Pate. He's a great bike rider, I know, because he's been a world champion at the under-23 level of the sport, but I'm not sure how Danny Phil is going to be able to climb against the likes of Egoi Martinez, Jose Luis Arrieta, and of course the man in the green jersey there from Australia, Simon Gerrans. Just looking at the front end there, and you can see that uh, they're all working fairly well. They know they've got probably to work, Phil, for about 30 kilometres, and then the climb will start in earnest. But unfortunately, the race organisation, uh, in a very pleasant way, probably because the road to the bottom of the climber was too narrow, have inserted a, a nasty climb at about uh, 15 kilometres before the yeah. foot of the final climb of the day. Uh, strangely enough, called the Colla della Morte, the climb of the death. Well, let's hope that doesn't come to reality. Goodness me, it looks as though the King of the Mountains went as well. David Miller also went of Gorman Chipotle. So a British cyclist uh, went down, and uh, we're now receiving information, in fact, that uh, Oscar Pereiro has definitely got a broken femur, um, as, um, sorry, has definitely got a broken shoulder, uh, but does not have a broken leg. So uh, that is a little bit better news uh, from the race director, Christian Prudhomme. Meanwhile, uh, Nibali is now at the back of the race, waiting for the arrival of the doctor since his fall, uh, but generally these races have all come back together. Well, Stewie O'Grady at the front here for Team CSC uh, whipping up the pace, and I'm fairly certain now this man went down very oh, hard indeed. Hard fall. This that, is Hunter. Robbie Hunter, yep. And that will have been the crash field, by the oh, way, yes, yes, involving a... Oscar Pereira. So he looks pretty ripped up, Robbie Hunter, but he's a tough character. And uh, what a day. Well, it's been a, a dramatic day, definitely, with the number of crashes we've had, and it's hard to believe. Sitting here on the finishing line, Phil, in Prato Nervosa, it's been an absolutely fabulous day. The sun has been out for nearly all of the afternoon, and yet it's been absolute chaos out on the roads. Well, you're beginning to see the blue sky peeping over the race now because they're only 40 kilometres on the twisty road away as the crow flies. They're probably only about 25 or 25 or 30 kilometres. Look at the face now. Stuart O'Grady of Australia has been getting better and better as this tour has got longer. He always comes good in the last week. He's now driving this race on. I'm still not too sure why. Well, I think what they're doing here, Phil, is they just want to toughen the race up. They now know they're not going to catch the four leaders, so forget about that. There is still a very important battle to be played out in the men who are looking at winning this bike race overall. Throw away the stage victory now because those four leaders are much too far in front but we've still got to have a battle on the final slopes of the climb. So I think what they're trying to do is make the race tough over these next 30 kilometres. Stuart O'Grady then will swing off and say, OK, Carlos Sastra, Andy Schleck, it's up to you now to go out and try and attack Cadell Evans. I've also noticed there's about four or five or even six riders from Team Columbia suddenly come up there too. Now, they've got Kim Kirkman in seventh place. You may recall he led the race in the opening week for a few days. And maybe everybody is planning an assault up this last climb to see what comes out of it. These are the four leaders at 14 minutes and 20 seconds. They're holding their own now. Danny Pate, uh, Arietta wants uh, something from the team car. Danny Pate rapidly getting that food down him. Very important on a day like this. Sitting on a winning break here. That's a very nice shot, isn't it? it certainly is. And it's uh, amazing the way they've managed to get the pictures back nice and stable. We had a lot of problems in the mm. first part of the afternoon just because of the weather conditions, but now we're in the heart of the Piemonte region of Italy, and uh, we're at the heart of uh, really the Tifosi of cycling here at Prato Nervoso because there's an unbelievable crowd have turned out to welcome the Tour de France, but they're going to welcome four riders, I think, Phil, to the start of the climb, none of which represent Italy. Absolutely right. Oh, Grady. Nicky Sorensen, first and second, whipping up the pacemaking, uh, just trying to make it a little bit tougher before they get to the foot of the climb. They want the bodies to be nice and hot. Italian flag is very prominent uh, along the way here, but also is the yellow jerseys and the yellow bunting on all of the little towns here. Just sitting at the back there, 151 is uh, 
Eric Zabel having a quick chat with Alessandro Balan, who went down quite heavily. Bernard Cole moving up on the right hand side over to the left hand side. Jens Voigt, I wonder when he'll be called to come to the front end of the main field. O'Grady swinging off now and he moves back into second place. So they're obviously very keen team Seafield to uh, keep a little bit of pressure on in the front end of the main field because I'm absolutely certain that the man uh, just behind, in fact, not riding too far away from Cadell Evans or Frank Schleck will have a try today to try and get himself that one second back. Well, Cadell has ridden a great race today. He's never taken himself too far away from the front. Only early on when he clearly felt the race was going to do nothing on the Col Daniel, uh, Col Daniel. He stayed midway down the field, but ever since the going has got a bit precarious, he's always been at the front of the race. This looks like it might be Eric Zabel here. Yep, it is Eric Zabel, 38 years of age, just the other day. And, uh, and again, he, he avoided the crash, as he always does. Yeah, he's a clever, clever bike rider, Eric Zabel. Always got the form from the beginning of the season right through to the very end of the year. I wouldn't be looking over my shoulder like that. So he's on the wheel here of big George Hincapi. Hincapi at the back end of the group. I think they're probably just waiting for the team management to come forward to take on board drinks and water. Well, if you look at the main field, they really are charging along at a fairly uh, fairly good pace, around about uh, 48, 49 kilometres an hour, while the leading group of riders here, Phil, are averaging still a good 45 kilometres an hour, and that's an indication that they're not going to pull them back. They are, in fact, uh, holding on to a good chunk of their advantage at 14 and a half minutes. Well, it will have been an almost race-long break. They got away about 9 kilometres into the day of 183. 37 are still to ride, and then we've got the small third category, and then the final first category climb up to the finish. And as always, the people here will have seen these four musketeers, having been on the front all of the way, they can expect a huge welcome on top at Prato Nervoso. The peloton, Cadell Evans always using a teammate to sit behind, he never goes to the front, but look at that, riding the fourth wheel and keeping his nose clean and out of trouble, and also in a position to anybody who attacks He'll see them go by and should be able to go after them. There's the chaos of the main field. A lot of the guys in this main field feel uh, are fairly happy that they managed to catch back up to the, the main field on the descent of that climb because a lot of sprinters were left behind, especially when we got to the tough part of the climb up towards the summit of the Col Daniel. Leonardo Duque, the Colombian sprinter, wants service at the back there. O'Grady, Nicky Sorensen. Coming up on the right-hand side there, it looks like Gustav. Passing the drinks out to the guys, keep the pace up, keep it nice and hard because uh, our leaders this afternoon want to have a good crack at trying to uh, dislodge Cadell Evans from the top spot in the race. In fact, the uh, leading group of four have stretched it out a fraction. Sad news, I suppose, for uh, Great Britain is the fact that Mark Cavendish, the man who's won himself four stages in the Tour de France this year, has uh, not started. He was getting just a little bit too tired. He'd won himself four stages and uh, with the Alps rapidly approaching. And on the other side of the Alps, the Beijing Olympics, I think he decided this morning to uh, pack his bags and head back to the United Kingdom to... It's a different kind of uh, event that he will be riding in the Olympic Games. He's uh, going to be riding on the track in a discipline called the Madison. And so as far as he's concerned, it's uh, probably better to, to leave the Alps uh, out of his agenda for this year. But I'm sure he will come back next season and he'll be looking at trying to get a crack at uh, winning the race for the points classification. That's says uh, Bouchery in the uh, team car there, and I notice uh, he looked as if he's had a, a little bit of an injury too. Ted de la Course, and again, uh, that little bit of problem there because of the fact that the riders have a very slight, thin lubricant on their uh, chains on a day like this, and with the weather being quite as bad as it has been, it's dried out a lot of the chains. <laughs> You might just have noticed there on uh, Serge Boucherie's uh, broken wrist there, he's got a, a little message that says, Recherchant sponsor, urgent. I'm looking for a new sponsor urgently. <laughs> yes, well, Curly Agricole, uh, theoretically, uh, do not have a sponsor for the uh, end of this year. The, the sponsorship has, uh, has run its course, and they're looking to try and bring a, a new sponsor in to keep them uh, out on the road. The main field. Now looking at uh, around about 40 kilometres to go for the main field as we go through here, the uh, Madola del Olmo. Just at the back, Andy Schleck, number 16. 
It looks like he's uh, gone to the back to do a little bit of work for the team. Carlos Sastra, number 11, uh, he'd been back and taken on board drinks for the rest of the team. I wonder if uh, Carlos Sastra is feeling all of that well this afternoon or if he just wasn't too concerned about picking up bottles as he rode back into the main field. We're now looking at 35 kilometers to go and still around about a 15 minute advantage for the four leaders and the four leaders are made up of uh, four different teams. Egoi Martinez, Jose Luis Arrieta, Simon Gerens and Danny Pate of the United States while in the main field. Cadell Evans is still uh, surrounded by his teammates and not too concerned about the chase that's happening because for him he's more concerned about what's going to happen when we get to the final 11 kilometers of the stage. The last 11 kilometers of the stage today are completely uphill from the valley floor around here in the district around Cuneo up to the ski resort of Prato Nevoso. And one man, we, we keep talking about the big battle uh, between the, the two riders from Team CSC, Carlos Sastra, and of course uh, Frank Schleck against the Cadell Evans. And we keep meaning uh, to forget Denny Menchov. And Denny Menchov has made himself the forgotten rider of the Tour de France so far. He's in fifth place in the overall classification. He's twice won the Vuelta a España, and this afternoon I wouldn't be surprised if he may well be the man to come out and try and get himself the victory. It would be a good place for Menchov to try and get himself a victory if he could this afternoon, uh, just to give himself a, a little bit of morale. He really is an all-rounder. He won the 11th stage of the Tour de France uh, in 2006, and that was in the Pyrenees. And because of that victory uh, on a big mountain stage, he lined himself up in 2007 as one of the pre-race favourites. But because of the way the race unfolded, he ended up uh, working for his teammate Michael Rasmussen, who eventually got kicked out. That long line, Paul, we can't go much faster than that. Stuart O'Grady is the man responsible largely for it. Cadell Evans looking very confident. It's going to be a battle uh, mano o mano on the climb, isn't it? It certainly will be a big battle. There's Robbie McEwen. He won't be taking part in the battle, I don't think. Uh, Andy Schleck has been riding at the back end of the group. And, uh, ah, there's the reason. Well, Fabian Cancellara making his way back into the main field there as well. Mm, Rodemir Gustaf in number 14 there. Six is Andy. They get themselves up the front, whatever their plan is. Let's see if they move off the bunch here. It's really going very quickly, but that gap isn't coming down. Well, the gap is not coming down at all. Uh, we, we're looking at some pretty serious bike riders, Phil, in the front end of the bike race here this afternoon. Men who've got serious pedigrees behind their names, uh, including Gerens, who won the Tour of Tour Down Under a little while back. And the funny thing is, when he won the Tour Down Under, his teammate on the squad that mm -hmm. year was Jose Luis Arrieta, who's in the break with him today. Well, they race with AG2R. That's absolutely right. This is Cuneo. This is the start town on Tuesday. It's where the riders spend their rest tomorrow. Yep, that's 47 kilometres to go to the finish uh, from Cuneo. And uh, we're nestled right in the middle of the mountains here. There are mountains all the way around us. And once the riders uh, meander out of Cuneo and uh, ride across the valley floor for a little bit longer, they will then uh, go over the third category climb, the Colla del Morte, and then they'll line up for the final 11 kilometers up to the summit here of Prata Nervoso. And with the massive advantage they've still got, one of these four men will be the, the glorious winner of the stage. But which one? Because they're all very good climbers. I'll tell you one thing, Phil, I have a, I'm having a hard time trying to figure out which one of these four riders has got the best crack at victory. Simon Gerrans has had a couple of wins so far this year. He won the first stage of the Route du Sud just before the start of the Tour de France. But Egoi Martinez hasn't won a lot of races, but he's a magnificent climber. And yeah. uh, Jose Luis Arrieta himself is a great climber. So I'd have to think that one of those riders is uh, one of the ones who's going to take the victory. I have to say, I have a feeling that Danny Pate will have a hard time staying with him. Yeah, I think so. He's, he seems to struggle on the climbs. He's also been struggling a bit because they... Don't forget the distance is now biting into his legs as well with only 32 to go. He's been in the lead for already for 140 kilometers. And the other three are a little bit more experienced. It depends how they tackle the climb. It doesn't start that steep, uh, but it soon catches up with it as it moves up towards the summit. The last seven kilometers are very hard.
They, they, they are very difficult indeed, and it's uh, really from the, the small town of uh, Mirolio at nine kilometers to go that the climb really starts to grip in. And that's when uh, we get up to the top part of the climb is where it is the steepest, Phil, because then in the last few kilometers it, it ha hangs out at around about 7.5%, and that's the steepest part of the day. There's the Garmin Chipotle car. Now, who are they about? Oh, this up with the leaders there, yes. We're looking at the Garmin Chipotle car up with Danny Pate, number 199. These four leaders are on the winning performance today. It's a question of which one will win and who will take the yellow jersey behind. Yep, it's going to be very difficult. It's a tough call here uh, because uh, three of these riders in the break are very good climbers. Simon Gerrans has had two victories so far this year, and in fact, he's the only man in the breakaway to have victories. The other two riders with him, though, are very experienced climbers. The man in the orange there, Egoi Martinez, a great climber, formerly a great domestique alongside Lance Armstrong on Team Discovery Channel. Jose Luis Arieta, formerly a teammate of Simon Gerrans, but himself a good climber, for having won a stage of the Tour of Spain a couple of years ago. The main field stretching out into a big long line, and I think the only reason that we're seeing the work being done by Team CSC is to try and set something up a little bit later on, and maybe for an increase of pace from either Frank Schleck or Carlos Sastra. Number 72 at the back there, that's Alessandro Balan. He crashed her dramatically a little while back when around about 25 riders went down as they entered into a roundabout a little while ago. There at the front, I can just see the yellow jersey there of uh, Cadell Evans, and nice and comfortable while uh, surrounding the main field. Is this is Silence Lotto with Robbie McEwen at the back. O'Grady hurting himself, and he knows that he's got to hurt himself for about another 20 kilometers, because once they get to the foot of the climb, I'm pretty certain that Stewie will use uh, Discretion is the better part of valour and pull off and then leave it up to the men who are reputedly the climbers of the team. And it's interesting the tactic currently of Team CSC because they're only using two riders, still keeping in reserve riders like Fabian Cancellara and Jens Voigt. Scrabbling up the outside there, that is uh, Dario Cioni. He's a former mountain biker, uh, born in Reading in the United Kingdom, and he's moving up the outside to take on board drinks for the men at the front because uh, those guys from Team Silence Lotto at the front end of the main field are not going to relinquish their places at the front end of the peloton. They want to keep it nice and high and they don't want to slip back. So one rider goes back to take on board drinks. Long line of the main field. And uh, almost everybody involved in that crash has got themselves back into the main field, but. A lot of riders went down in that crash a little while back. In fact, uh, nearly all of the Garmin Chipotle team went down there, including Trent Lowe, Julian Dean. And we do believe that Christian van der Velde went down, and he's a man that started the day in third place in the overall classification. Just look at the faces of all these riders. Look at the face now on Nicky Sorensen. He's really digging deep. He's really hurting his body. He knows he's got around about uh, half an hour of pacemaking on the front end of the main field like this. Johan van Sommeren sitting just behind them. They don't care at all, these guys from Silence Lotto, because they can feel the challenge coming. Now, then. now this is uh, Jens Voigt. Now, Jens has been uh, cut up quite a bit there. And I presume uh, he must have gone down in that crash a little earlier on, and that's a little bit of sad news. He's got his radio off there, and I think it could well be because he's changed his jersey and uh, suffering a little bit from his knee. There's been a lot of crashes on the race this afternoon. 14 uh, minutes and 44 seconds, and despite the work being done on the front end of the main field by CSC, it's doing nothing at all to affect the front end of the main field. I almost feel the pain that Stuart O'Grady's going through, can't you, when you look into his eyes there? Fifth position for Cadell Evans, making sure that uh, if there are any more uh, accidents or incidents on the road that he's not going to be involved in them or delayed by them. He will try and ride at the front end of the main field as long as he can, and I think today he's going to hope that Yaroslav Popovic can stay up with him uh, as long as possible on the slopes of the climb. There we're going. We've gone through the town of Cuneo. This is the, the plains of Cuneo, right in the very heart of the Piemonte region of Italy. 
As you can see there, it's coming up to 10 to 5 in the afternoon local time for the main field. Uh, the leading group of four as they go through 28 kilometers to go. This is the small town of Chiusa de Pezio in the Pezio Valley. And this part of the world, in fact, uh, they used to make a lot of glass and crystal in uh, years gone by and not too far away from where the riders just went there in fact is a glass and crystal museum and that is an indication that uh, probably in about one and a half kilometers they should be looking at the start of the climb of the Colle della Morte 14 and a half minutes uh, is their advantage Danny Pate in the white jersey just on the far side now these riders have uh, got to start to figure out especially the three riders there in the orange or the green and the blue and white jersey which one of them has got the strength to win the stage i'd like to think that simon gerens has he's been the most successful rider in the breakaway this year with two victories one in march in the very difficult race of the uh, criterium international and another one in june in the route du sud which was just before the race well, that's the profile of the stage. You can see the big lump that we've been over there. We're now just starting the Colla della Morte. This is the hors d'oeuvre, Paul. As our cameras shoot up and look out, I'm not sure. I don't think that is where we're sitting because looking out my window, I can't see the cloud bank around it. Um, but that certainly is the, in the area of where the riders will eventually go today. We just started the third category climb. The Colla del Morte, which is where the four leaders are, uh, but certainly you can see uh, we're heading right into the clouds. We're not too far away from uh, no. where the cloud cover is. The cloud is actually up above us. The riders of the main field going through that town there of San Lorenzo, and they are at 38 kilometres to go, Phil, while uh, these guys are still almost 10 kilometres up the road. Danny Pate, uh, I'm not sure what uh, the team management would say to him in a situation like this, but I would think uh, from the top of this climb to the finish climb, he need, now needs to start to think about trying to conserve a little bit of energy. Well, Jonathan Waters has said that uh, Danny Pate always looks tired, so he never takes any uh, solace about how he looks. Um, he just doesn't know. He knows he's up against three climbers, and this is their terrain. And it's because of these three climbers that they've kept such a big lead today. Now it's up to Danny. He's not showing signs of weakness right now, is he? No, not at all. Uh, you can never take away from the fact that the young man there in the middle in the blue and white jersey from Team Garmin Chipotle, Phil, has been a world champion. The world champion at the under-23 level of the sport, but still, you've got to be a top man to win a world title. And he's got the pride to try and pull himself inside out to stay in contact with these riders. But as you say, the three other riders, uh, Gerens on the front, Jose Luis Arieta in second and uh, Egoi Martinez in third. They are really seriously good climbers, Phil. They are, and I know that all of Australia will root for Simon Goerens. He's a very nice guy, and he's won all of Australia's big races, but he's never won a stage of the Tour de France, and he's got his shot today because the whole team that, that Goerens rides for, Credit Agricole, a French setup, has been built around Tor Hushoff to win the green sprinter's jersey. Well, Tor has, I think, uh, lost that jersey, slipped too far down. So now there might be a consolation prize on the way for them today. Well, so far over the last uh, 10 minutes or so of the race, the workload really, Phil, has been pretty much equally shared. Egoi Martinez, 24%, Gerens, 25%. Danny Pate, a fraction less at 23%, but you can't really complain too much, I don't think, about that. No, he's, uh, he's the least experienced. And cool pedalling here from Egoi Martinez, the, the Basque team rather let the side down in front of their Spanish supporters when we were in the Pyrenees, so maybe they'll uh, go to the chagrin of the Italian supporters here as the Spanish in the breakaway looking very strong at the moment, these two. A little funny, a uh, little earlier on, I just noticed Serge Bouchery in the team car of Credit Agricole mm. with a, a splint on his arm. He's actually broken his wrist in uh, an accident. I'm not sure exactly how the accident happened, but there was a message on the splint which said, uh, Cherchons sponsor avec urgence. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another thing that we need to remember about Simon Gerens. He, he needs to look for the victory here this afternoon because, in fact, Credit Agricole, at the end of this year, their sponsorship ends, and they're currently still in negotiations to try and bring a new sponsor on board. Yes, Roger has promised to re uh, reply by the 1st of August on that issue. Some people think he's got one and saying nothing, but we don't know. These are the four riders on the Col del Mort. 14 minutes 23, I take my hat off to them, they've lost nothing of the lead here and the field were really chasing, they've made nil impression on that breakaway. 
Another round of I begin to fear every time I look at this picture. Now I expect to see two piles of riders well, lying in the road. Well, every time I see a roundabout like that, I think we've just switched replay. back to a replay, and I'm <laughs> waiting too. to see the riders fall down again. There's Yaroslav Popovich in the dark glasses there for Team Silence Lotto. He's a real experienced bike rider, you know. He's a man that many people felt that one day he could win the Tour de France or even the Giro d'Italia. He's been bought into Silence Lotto for only one thing, and that's this month, and that's to look after Cadell Evans on especially yep. days like today, on the final climb here up to Prato Nervoso. And we should be in the sun all the way now. Just look again at the crowd here in Italy as we climb this small uh, third category hill. And it looks like Arietta is just accelerated a little bit. Igor Martinez will go after him. They're racing for the prize on the top. You can't allow a gap to open now because they won't wait for you. So Danny Pate needs to bury himself and hold on. Martinez has moved over and allowed Arietta to win that because Martinez got the other one, I think. Gentlemen, the act. And third place is Gerrand and fourth is Danny Pate. But what's interesting, Phil, is looking at all of those four riders, not one of them really is showing any signs of fatigue currently. They're all pedaling very fluently. They are. This is going to be a big battle at the final climb. Yes, it will. And there you can see the main field, and uh, we're still looking at uh, pretty much uh, close to a quarter of an hour deficit for the leading group of four riders. Uh, now that they've gone over the Colla della Morte, the riders will drop down into the small town of Roccoforte, Mondovi. And there uh, they will then ride along the valley floor, Phil, for a, a little while. Maybe about, uh, i make it around about 10 kilometres, and then they'll start the final climb of the day, where you can see at the front end of the main field, these guys, are, despite the fact that they're 14 and a half minutes behind, there's a lot of heads rocking in there, a lot of shoulders rocking. There's a lot of tired men today. Yeah, there are a lot of guys outside the doctor's surgery tomorrow, having seen so many riders with holes in the shorts, bleeding from the arms. Jens Voigt had a fall as well. Um, there's quite a few knocked around after those shots. And in fact, I, I found out, Paul, all of the Garmin Chipotle team were down in that crash, all eight. Well, it's always good to uh, enhance team spirit, I suppose, if uh, everybody goes down on the ground at the same time. And uh, I wonder if they were all uh, uninjured, because that's the yes, important thing for Christian yeah. van der Velde, because van der Velde, currently in third place in the overall standings, I reckon is um, a good, serious outsider to have a crack today. Well, he's going to try, but uh, they feel as though they're going to have to wait and see just what Cadell Evans does here. And Cadell Evans will probably wait to see just what Frank Slick does. And so it's going to be a most interesting fight from the peloton, even after the day has been won by those four riders, because at 14.26 and 15 miles or 24 kilometres to go, there's no way now they're coming back. And it's going to be a good battle. We've got two races today, two very distinct races. Yes, definitely, two races. Uh, the race for the win of the stage, which itself is very prestigious for the four riders off the front end of the main field. And then uh, 13 kilometres away for the leading group of four. But also, there will be a battle for supremacy in the yellow jersey competition. The funny thing is that those four leaders, Phil, uh, the closest one is Egoi Martinez, and he's more than 50 minutes behind Cadell Evans in the overall standings, and that's why they're not too concerned about the position of the four leaders. Just look at the effort being put in here by Stuart O'Grady and Nicky Sorensen just behind. They are really trying to stretch this field and hurt the main bunch. Well, they are, but uh, what they're doing is they're only using two riders on the squad, which means they can keep a number of riders in reserve. So that tells me that they are actually planning something, Phil, for this climb. I think that Team CSC will race on every one of these mountain stages. Watch out on the next little climb, the third cat stepping boss going to the next climb and the last climb of the day because they're always going to hit that very fast. Not so far away from that at the moment, 14.12. Just shows you how fast that breakaway is going, unless our clock stops, because we're hardly getting any closer. Here we are, up with the leaders now. This is Simon Goins, team tip coming from the car. Good chat with the team manager. I was trying to see uh, just exactly who was driving the team car there, because the uh, second team manager uh, says Bouchery uh, can't drive with a broken wrist. As you look at the main field, Le Pouleton coursing their way through the valley here uh, around the Cuneo. I'm wondering uh, how they managed to le let those guys get off the front end of the main field. Uh, Arietta, Martinez and Gerens were the riders over the top end of the main field with uh, Danny Pate getting himself fourth position there and a single point. Evans, seventh position in the yellow jersey. He knows uh, 
but he will get challenged on the slopes of this climb, the kind of a climb that is going to suit riders like the powerhouse from Spain, uh, Alejandro Valverde. Denny Menchov is also the kind of rider who, with his strength, may well enjoy uh, the possibility of attacking on the slopes of a climb like this while we rejoin the leading riders here. This is the town that, that they're coming through now, uh, Roccaforte Mondovi. And we're now looking at 11 kilometers to go to the start of the final climb of the day. There's an interesting uh, church in here, the Church of San Maurizio, which dates back to the 16th century. There used to be a big stronghold here, which uh, protected the entrance into the valley that we're about to go into, up to the summit here of uh, Prato Nevoso. Again, you can see Martinez had had a cash too. Well, we're now looking at 21.7 kilometers to go and still around about a 14-minute advantage for the four leaders. And I think the situation we're looking at here is at two separate races on today's stage. A race to see who can win the individual stage, get the glory for being the first to the summit of the climb here, Prato Nervoso. And, of course, a race for supremacy in the yellow jersey race in the group behind. The yellow jersey on the shoulders of Cadell Evans. And Evans will be wondering where the attack is going to come from, which quarter will it come from? Will it come from CSC? Will it come from Alejandro Valverde? Maybe it will even come from uh, a little bit further back and Denny Menchov. Just looking up at the four leaders. But Danny Pate actually doesn't look too bad here and he got himself over the big climb of the day. And although he doesn't have the reputation of uh, being a great climber, at the end of a, a long stage like this, it, it's interesting how the body can react, although not one of these riders in the leading group of four here has shown any real signs of weakness. And that uh, banner over the road there indicates 20 kilometres to the finish. 13.35, that's the uh, site of 20 kilometres to go, a mere 12 miles left to race, Paul. Unfortunately, all bar about two or three of them are uphill. That's the tough thing for these guys, Phil, and I keep looking at these four leaders and I, I cannot pick one man who is stronger than the rest. And even looking mm. at Danny Pate, even though he doesn't have the reputation of a great climber or a man who's uh, been over the big mountain passes in uh, recent history, he doesn't look like a man either, showing any signs of weakness in his pedalling style, his body language. And I think the man who'll win the stage is going to be the one who survived the best on this stage. I can only imagine all four will attack one another and the one that stays best will win, that's the way to go. The average speed now is going up all the time, it's almost 25 miles an hour now. As we get into Chiusa Pesio, this is the town at the foot of the climb now which will take us on to the last climb of the day. There's the four leaders and you're right Paul, these guys have really shared out the pacemaking today. There's been a way since the ninth kilometre. Yeah, there's nobody tried to uh, play the, the clever chap in the breakaway and uh, missed his turns. They've all been pretty much sharing the pacemaking equally throughout the whole of the afternoon. Maybe Danny Pate for the last couple of kilometres of the big climb, the Col d'Angel, didn't do too much, but I think he was just making sure that he didn't get dropped there. There's so a little bit problem. of a problem at the back. That's a flat tyre. Agri to Bell. Yes, that was a flat tyre from one of the riders from Agri Tubel, and I think that, in fact, was Jimmy Casper going back there. O'Grady still sacrificing himself. He knows he's got to keep on the front end of the main field here. He's got a long way to go to keep the pressure on, and I think it's all to set something up for a little bit later on, because you might just have noticed that there were one or two more riders moving up to the front end of the main field there for Team CSC, and the big man that they call Spartacus the Gladiator, Fabian Cancellara, was moving up on the outside. He too, I think, may well be getting himself ready to set up the foot of the climb for Carlos Sastra and, of course, possibly Frank Schleck. You can see that long line there in the main field, looking a little bit further back there. You can see uh, right behind uh, Fabian Cancellara, the red, white and blue jersey of Frank Schleck. I reckon he's waiting for something. And this man doing all of the work here as we start the third category climb. And that again is Stuart O'Grady. Now they get to sample this huge crowd. This is nothing as to what's sitting on the mountain top, I'll tell you. It certainly isn't. It really is a magnificent crowd. But Phil, there's a lot of riders now from Team CSC starting to move to the front end of the main field. And we're just starting the climb with the main peloton of the Colla del Morte. 
As you can see, look at Cancellara. this over on the right-hand side. Cancellara, and not too far behind Cancellara, is a man wearing a red, white and blue jersey. That just happens to be Frank Schleck. Well, take a look at the face there of Cadell Evans. Well, we can't see it now. He's just gone behind a teammate. Um, he doesn't look as though he's panicking. He knows he's going to be hit. Menchov is not far away either. The pace being set by CSC rider Kurt Adelarvison. All that brilliant pace making by Stewart. Job done now. Get home as best you can as he lets the race go away from him. And look at this man too, Nicky Sorensen. They have ridden like a couple of Trojans on the front end of the main field. You can also see Bernard Eisel slipping away as well there from the main field. These guys now have just got to try and survive. Well, this climb is hurting the riders who set the pace. Now they will just ride home here as the real race for yellow is about to begin, I reckon. Looking down from the helicopter, they're on the third category climb, but they're way too far behind the leaders. The leaders will win the day, but it does look as though CSC has a plan here. That's Kurt Attel Arvison, a stage winner, but more primarily, a rider on Team CSC is setting the pace. Yep, they're all moving up to the front. <laughs> look out for the green jersey there, because uh, our friend Oscar Ferreira, Phil, is not far away from the front end of the main field. Kurt Atler Arvison looked at Robbie McEwen slipping off the back end of the main field. It's starting to get a little bit grippy now for the sprinters once again. And it's going to be a question of survival for many men as all they can do is just hope to get to the finish line, Phil, inside of the elimination time. Well, Robbie will go back to Stuart O'Grady, Bernard Isol, and the riders who have been dropped now. Arvison is setting the pace. Cancellara is on the right. It looks as though we've got all of CSC trying to break in here. They've got two potential tour winners, and they know it. They've got Carlos Sastra and Frank Schleck, and they're going to hurt Ken Cadell Evans at every opportunity. The thing is, Paul, Cadell is ready and expects this to happen. He's expecting something, and I think he will expect something, Phil, on every day of the Alpine passes when we go into them from Team CSC. But what he may not well be expecting is a secret attack that might come from Denny Menchov. Menchov is in fifth place overall at the start of the day, and a lot of people think that man is the silent killer. They think he's the man who could come out of the wings and do something very special here this afternoon. And I have to say, it's the kind of finish that would suit a man like Denny Menchov. Well, CSC have put their cards firmly on the table here. Of the six riders in that line, five are on team CSC. Just the one rider from Lotto trying to bake it up, and it's Popovich. Well, just looking down at the hill there, you can see that the damage is being done. That's the front end of the main field, but look at these riders being tailed off one by one, group by group. These, the are, split. these are the big men. These are the men who do not like going uphill at all. There is the split. Even Fabian Reckman in the white jersey is here. This is the tempo riding by Arvison, reducing the Tour de France in half, creeping up on the left now. It looks like Leon Sanchez of Case de Pond, so he's bringing his riders up. Sadly, today they've lost Oscar Pereira, uh, Oscar Pereira rather, with a broken shoulder. Well, the orange jersey there on the shoulder of the yellow jersey of Cadell Evans is Denny Menchov. He's moving up to keep a very close eye on affairs. And uh, the last time, in fact, the Giro d'Italia came up here, Phil, in the year 2000. On that occasion, the first man to the top of the climb here was Francesco Casagrande, who outsprinted Stefano Garzelli and Gilberto Simoni. Climb that, all. That gives you an indication of just how difficult this climb is going to be. And I'm sure Cadell Evans knows that. Just slipping backwards, Dario Cioni. Yes, that will and be. In fact, this morning, Cadell was saying he was hoping that Dario would have a better day today, but he's gone before the climb. And that's why I think CSC are all over the front end of the main field. This man here, Kurt Adler Arvison, is now going to do exactly what Stuart O'Grady did, exactly what Nicky Sorensen did. He's going to sacrifice himself, Phil, over the flat part of this course. This race, the four leaders, is pretty much over. They're four kilometres now from the bottom of the climb. 12.45 at the top of the mort. There's the banner indicating... 15 kilometers to go 15 kilometers to go to the summit but four kilometers to go to the bottom of the climb and still these guys are holding on to a huge chunk of their advantage they're not concerned at all i don't think now by the return of the main field behind because these men are good climbers they still think looking at the way they're pedaling here they've got enough time in hand to survive any onslaught they won't conserve 12 minutes at the top of the climb that's for absolute certain because we're going to have a great battle on the climb up to Prata Nervoso, but 
they should hold enough to stay out in front for the victory and in fact stay out in front for the first four places well they've tipped over the top now and the pressure is staying on here as they race away the bunch has got 25 kilometers more or less to go there's the banner indeed csc and now it's the big world time trial champion he paved the way to otakam uh, on the early parts of the Calder Tourmalet, and then he dropped off on the climb of Otakam. Now Cancellara is doing it again. 12.36 at the moment. This is Igor Martinez. It will be de very difficult to say which one of these four will win. It's hard to put your money on any of these riders, uh, and even you can't, I don't think, really discount Danny Pateful because, uh, as we said a little earlier, he's been a world champion. He's not a great climber. But this kind of climb, if you've got uh, a little bit of strength left in the legs after a breakaway like this, he could stay in contact. But I wonder if the first man to move will be Egoi Martinez, because he is a great champion who for many years rode alongside Lance Armstrong on Team Discovery Channel. Well, either way, these four boys are riding a very fast tempo here right now. We are 14 kilometers away. We are about to start the final climb of the day. Prato Novoso, these riders come to it with a wonderful time gap of over 12 minutes. The winner of today's stage of the Tour de France is right in front of our cameras now. Then in the pack behind, the whole of CSC are here to try and destroy Cadell Evans in one. This is the team that everybody in the Tour de France has been scared of. The man on the front, they all fear his turn of speed. A Fabian Cancellara in the orange glasses, followed by Jens Voigt, followed by Kurt Adler Arvison. They want to do something here this afternoon. They're a scary team, and they've come to the Tour de France this year with only one thought. That's to win the bike race overall. They haven't been in any breakaways. We've never seen a move by Jens Voigt except on the Col de Tourmalet. And that's why now they're coming into the crucial part of the race as far as they're concerned. The three Alpine stages are when they need to lay down the foundations for victory for one of their men. But which one? Carlos Sastre or Frank Schleck? Now Bernard Cole there on that caption is the new leader today in the King of the Mountains. But there's double points at the top of the finishing climb today. They could still reverse a little bit. But right now, these four are still holding the gap. Gerens blowing a bit, puffing a bit, just thinking what's going to happen now. I'm with three great climbers. He will know Jose Luis Arieta very well. They raced for the same team, uh, AG2R, for a couple of years when, in fact, uh, Simon Gerens won himself the tour down under in Australia. And uh, he will probably know the reputation of the man in the orange jersey as well, Egoi Martinez. A couple of years ago, a few years ago, in fact, he was the winner, of course, of the Tour de l'Avenir, a race which is regarded as the race of the hopefuls, a race of the future. And when he was, uh, for many people, regarded as a possible winner of the Tour de France, since then he's turned his attention to working for great leaders, leaders like, of course, Lance Armstrong, who signed him up for Team Discovery Channel a couple of years ago. The faces here, the four leaders, are giving absolutely nothing away. They look as though they're almost relishing this last climb. And look at the team time trial here. All of the riders of Team CSC and Cadell Evans has got onto the tail, as you can see, because he knows they're going to launch a series of attacks. But at the end of all these attacks, Paul, at this moment in time, all Cadell has to watch is the whereabouts of Frank Schleck. Well, uh, that's the most important man for him to keep a close eye on, but the thing is they've got a very good tactical manoeuvring ability here. They've got two riders that Cadell Evans really needs to watch. If he watches Frank Schleck too much, they've got the ability to launch Carlos Sastra onto the attack. Although I don't think today, Phil, the climb is steep enough for a man like Carlos Sastra. It is steep enough and uh, easy enough for a man, of course, like Denny Menchov to make the move. We need to be a bit higher in the sky to read what that says, but everybody's ready for us. Another edition of uh, yellow T-shirts. The Tour de France now heads on to the climb of Prato Nervoso. I think it's upside down. Yeah, it, it says, says Viva, Viva, Tour. Oh, Viva, Viva Tour. Tour. Yes, the helicopter <laughs> was the wrong side of it. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty impressive. They've done a great job. Italy is enjoying the Tour de France here this afternoon. There are the four leaders, very good. and they can't feel be very far away now from the start of the climb. Maybe a couple of kilometres. Vive le Tour, absolutely. Vive le Tour, vive le Tap, because it's been a great stage in many ways. Four riders really did pull the wool over the eyes of the back group. A big pack today. 
they gained enough time at one stage over 17 minutes and they haven't lost that much they will lose a lot now uh, but who cares because they'll share the stage and then we've got a great race behind for who takes the yellow jersey tonight there's the speed check there they're going at 70 kilometers an hour that is pretty scary that's all because of the pressure on the front end of the main field of team csc the scariest team i have to say in the main field and this is a place you certainly would not want to be at 70 kilometers an hour no. at the back end of the peloton roads are closed the crowds off the streets and so it's okay to speed today 11.9 kilometers to go the four leaders here and the slopes are slight but we're about to start the climb itself now well just around the corner phil uh, this is going to be the small town of uh, merolio there's a little certain roundabout they will take a right hand turn at that roundabout and then the climb will start in earnest it's pretty steady to begin with, it's around about 5 or 6 percent, but once they get up to the last half of the climb, it really cranks itself up to around about 8.5 percent. Danny Pate dives the wheel of Igor Martinez. Underneath the buntings here, this is the base town, and now we're heading up towards the ski station of Prato Novoso. And the sun is out, and it looks like it's going to be a clear climb for the four leaders who go onto the slopes of the last day with a lead of just 12 minutes. I thought for a moment there you were going to say the sun is out, the sky is blue, and we're about to have a pretty impressive charge of the light brigade up the climb here. There is the start of the climb, 11.4 kilometres to the summit. The four leaders are still holding on to an 11 minute and 20 second advantage and we're right at the start of the final climb of the day, but which man is the freshest of this leading group of four? Only one man, it's a shame really, Phil, after a four-man breakaway like this, that only one man can actually win the stage. Always the old scenario, two Spanish riders, an Australian and an American, and the whole of Team CSC not trying to catch them, but trying to break Cadell Evans. Kurt Adler Arvison champion of Norway right on the front behind him is the man from Switzerland Fabian Cancellara a little bit further back you can see Jens Voigt really toughening up this race while we start the early slopes of the climb now Egoi Martinez is quite happy to set the pace making he wants to ride at his own pace but who's going to make a move I have to say in third place there he looks very comfortable the Aussie in the, the green and white jersey of Credit Agricole Simon Gerrans Nobody for the moment, looks as if they're showing any sign of weakness. Martinez pulls off, looks across, he's looking to see if he can see any signs on the face of Jose Luis Arrieta in the blue and white for AG2R. Pate taking that fourth position, quick confirmation of the gap, 11 minutes to the main field, don't worry about that guys. I don't think anybody in this breakaway is going to lose a minute for every kilometre of the ascent because the first three riders in this group now are all very good climbers. Danny Pate's got it down to a, a very nice gear. He's uh, just twiddling the gears over, keeping it nice and supple. Whereas behind, there is a battle. There's a huge battle going on now. Fabian Cancellara, this is going to dish out a whole load of pain. And once the Jens Voigt in second position comes to the front, that'll be pain times two. Right up there, Johan van Sommeren in front of the man who wears number one, Cadell Evans. Behind him, Yaroslav Popovic. A little bit further back, there is the champion of Spain, Alejandro Valverde. On his shoulder is, uh, Jose, is Luis Leon Sanchez. Back up to the four leaders. Simon Gerrans drops back into fourth place, but I think this is just to have a quick look. See what the guy's legs look like, see if he can see anybody showing signs of weakness and wondering how he's going to plan his assault on this final 10 kilometers of the race. So there is the indicator, 10 kilometres to go. 10 kilometres to go, 10 minutes and 46 seconds, and still nobody's shown any signs of weakness or any signs of wanting to attack. Arietta at the back, Gerrans in third position, Danny Pate moving up into first, the Egoi Martinez in the orange jersey. No sign of weakness for any one of these riders now. I cannot pick a winner. Looking at these four riders, Paul, they might wait a little bit because the, it's six miles still to climb, or nearly 10 kilometres, but it gets harder as we get higher. Well, just looking at the riders, uh, Phil, I was thinking um, 
I wonder which one is going to make the move first while behind. This is a massive battle here. Cancellara, Jens Voigt, Gustav, a little bit further back, Andy Schleck. So I think Andy Schleck sacrificing himself for the team here this afternoon. Fifth in the line there is Carlos Sastra. A little bit further back in the middle of the riders there in the red, white and blue is Frank Schleck. Cadell Evans looks pretty comfortable. This is an unbelievable team. Uh, they've been phenomenal. And uh, I want a lot of them, riders like Jens Voigt, he must have had to bite his lip for many, many days because he's the kind of guy he likes to attack in a bike race. He wants to go off the front. He's had to be patient. He's waited, Phil, for 15 days. I think he's as strong as we've ever, ever seen him, Jens Voigt. We saw him ride like this on Otakam. Now we're seeing it again here on the first day of three in the Alps, broken by a rest day tomorrow in Cuneo. He's been on the floor today, Jens as well, so he must be pretty tall, out, uh, sore too. These are the four riders again showing. Now, Danny Page is jog dodging back wheels here, so maybe he's feeling a little bit tired right now. He's got to hang on. The pressure is on at nine kilometres to go. We are looking at the four riders in the leading break. Ten minutes, 13 at the gap. Danny Page, I think, is tired. He's following the wheels and he's not contributing to the pace. Well, he may be just being clever here because I think, for my money, Martinez is the man to beat. He's the strongest rider. His accelerations when he comes to the front end of that group are a little bit nerve-wracking, I think, for the other riders. I was just thinking, Phil, the man with the best acceleration on the climb in that leading group of four riders has to be Simon Gerrans. Cancellara's pulled off. Thank you very much, and I'll see you guys tonight. Now it's up to big Jens Voigt, the German tank. And he drives on here, but they're losing men, and they've lost Cancellara. Jens Voigt battling now. There's only one, uh, two, three riders left to take the pacemaking up from him. Behind him, Gustav, there's a problem at the back here. Now, this is one of the riders from uh, Team uh, Case de Pania, and that is uh, David Lopez. So that's one less rider to look after the hopes of Alejandro Valverde. It sounds as if uh, Robbie Hunter has come off the back end of the main field. Now, that's not a surprise because he's been involved in a, a slight accident out on the road. And uh, also, they're saying that David Miller has been dropped from the main field as well. So, Miller out of the back of the peloton. Uh, while we look here, this is a concentrated effort there. Carlos Sastra sitting in fourth place. Now, look at the concentration, Phil, on and the face Andy of Schleck. Andy Schleck. Yes, the young man in the race. He was the white jersey leader. He passed that over eventually via Rico down to Nabali, who's also been on the floor today. There's the peloton, and there's still a big group here, despite all the pressures. They've got quite a lot of riders. Oscar Ferrer finally has said, enough is enough, and he's going to just ride home now to live to fight another day in that points competition. Well, he's got a massive lead in the points competition. He doesn't have to worry too much about stages like today. He leads that competition, by the way, by 47 points. Bernard Cole moving up on the right-hand shoulder there of this man, and as you can see, Cadell Evans, behind those dark glasses, Phil, you cannot see the concentration that he must be going through. He's got to concentrate on the day in hand. He's got to wait and see who's going to be the person to attack him. Queuing up behind him, though, is big Denny Menshoff. Menshoff has still got Juan Antonio Fletcher alongside him. And Juan Antonio Fletcher uh, in the newspapers this morning, Phil, said, I am dedicating the next three days to my man, Denny Menshoff. Trouble here, team uh, Gerard Cholik, the sprinter, also at the back of the race now. These are the riders who are gradually waving farewell to the pacemakers here, all CSC. Cadell Evans knows where the enemy lies within because he sits there on the wheel. But there were nine, there are now only four guys in front of him. Frank Schleck a little bit further back, but it's absolutely true. Denny Menshoff is stalking the field here. And the Italians have lost their chance of winning this stage. Done his job, number 13, uh, upside down 13 for Fabian Cancellari. Set the pace along the valley road before swinging off, and all he will do will survive. Well, actually, Team CSC Phil have pretty much splintered the main field here, and still, big Jens Voigt comes battling up to the front. Vladimir Gusov will be the next rider to take over the pacemaking, and it's a little bit too much for David Moncoutier this afternoon. Yes, and there's little Samuel Dumoulin, the winner in Nantes. He's also cracked, and it looks like the King of the Mountains is seeing the leadership pass over to his teammate today. Also cracking at the back of the group there, 1-1-1, one, 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 Stefan Schumacher, the erstwhile leader of this bike race. Yes, well, the time has been lost and no longer counts now. These boys are all dropping out of the race to ride home. Their day done, number 54 here. Uh, attack here by uh, Egoi Martinez. 
Well, he's gone early because I would have put him down to attack after the others try to move. He's tempting them out to play here. And he's caught Arietta. I thought Arietta looked a little bit ropey as this climb started. And if they slow down, he'll ride himself back in. But if they apply the pressure, I think he will be dropped. And look at Danny Pate. Is he tired? He's got a lot, lot of courage if he is. Well, he's pulling himself inside out and he's pulled himself right back there to the wheel of Egoi Martinez. Now, I don't think Egoi Martinez expected that. I have to say, I think that's the first of many moves. Uh, Jose Luis Arieta, surprisingly enough to me, was the first man to get caught out in the crossfire. But getting out of the saddle again, Danny Pate is uh, starting to lose a length there on Egoi Martinez. Martinez standing on the pedals. Pate says, right, you're not going away from me, mate. I want to win a stage of the Tour de France this afternoon. Simon Gerrans is a good climber. He needs to get himself back into the rhythm, not to panic. Don't go into the red zone, because if you go into the red zone, you never come out. At seven and a half kilometers to go now, Egoi Martinez, a former teammate of Lance Armstrong, has tried to split this leading group of four, but one man has resisted the first attack, and that is Danny Pate of the United States of America and Garmin Chipotle. He's pulled himself back up to the Spaniard. They caught out for a little while, Simon Gerrans there in the green jersey, and I have to say, Gerrans is slowly dragging himself back into this race. Now the question is, Paul, Simon Gerrans is going to have to kick back. I think Arietta has gone here, but it looks on this occasion, Simon will climb back up to the two pacemakers. Climbing back up, I think he's clawing his way back up to these loop two men at the front of the race. I'm impressed with Danny Pate. You know, a little earlier we were talking about Danny Papeville and we mentioned that he'd been a former world champion at the under-23 level of the sport. Mm. Well, when you've been a world champion, it's a special tag Ooh. that you've got on your back, and that's why I think he's pulled himself up here. He wants to win a stage of the Tour. Now, this is Schleck's turn. Let's not forget the other part of the Tour de France, because this is Andy Schleck here setting the pace with Carlos Sastra, and now there are only two riders in front of Cadell Evans from that team, and Cadell does not look stressed at all. This is Jens Voigt, job done. And just how small is that leading group now? And the Mayo Jean is riding like a leader just at this moment. He's just sitting there, just keeping his eye on the men in front of him. He's keeping his eye on number 11. That's the rider second in the line there. And that rider just happens to be Carlos Sastra. Yaroslav Popovic uh, <laughs> flicking his wrist there. He has to stay with Cadell for as long as possible. Behind him is the big Russian rider in the orange jersey, Denny Menchov. But that was why he flicked his wrist. He wanted to move out and he gave the signal to Denny Menchov. I'm not sure that Popo is going quite that well, although he's gone on to the back there. Watch out for the rider with the red top. That's Frank Schleck. One second behind Cadell Evans. Cadell is just hanging on to these two riders here. Ten kilometres to go, and Martinez has gone again, further up the road. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> ten kilometres to go. Wrong end of the, the field, field, sorry. <laughs> that was somebody going off, probably Samuel Sanchez here. Another shed as the riders at the front all stay together. Well, uh, you, as you can see now, this has become, Phil, a very select group. Uh, just watch out there for Frank Schleck, because Frank Schleck is looking just a little bit dangerous there, and he's the man I think may well be thinking about moving up onto the acceleration. But Christian van der Velde is in the group. He's also sitting quite pretty. Prado Novoso, 11.4 kilometres. We go to 1,440. It's 6.9%. Cadell Evans has just followed the wheels of a team which has lost their drivers one by one. The only man they're interested to, really, is Sastra and Schleck, and they are both waiting for the moment. They will attack, but they've got to wait till all of their team drop off. The other rider in here who's impressive is Vladimir Efimkin. With the disqualification of Rico, he has a stage win to his name now. Now Andy Schleck has kept the pressure on a fraction there, and now we can see what's happening at the back end of the group here. There's still riders getting tailed off one by one. That's a good ride by Johan Schott, but he's gone now. As we go further up, Jerome Pino is still there. But this is a race now of now strong men. Now what, there's the attack by Sastra. Cadell Evans has to answer that one, but no need to panic. Sastra is a long way behind for the moment. Bernard Cole as well. This is a decisive move. The yellow jersey is still looking strong. Well, the yellow jersey is looking strong, but he's not the one who's chasing them down. In fact, the pressure is coming on the front there, Phil, by the man from Russia, Denny Menchov. good for Cadell. 
Right Others up there. have got a race two in this event. Others got to race two in this event, but it just goes to show that Team CSC are going to do everything. Bernard Cole has grappled onto the back wheel of the Spanish rider there, and Van der Velde is still in contact. Well, Bernard Cole on the right in the light blue is the new leader in the King of the Mountains for sure now. He'll get double points up here on the top for the first few riders over. Well, that was the first card played by Sastra when he's come to the attacks on their stars, and that has cracked David Arroyo. Well, uh, I tell you what, that was a very well laid plan by Jens Team Sissi. Again, you can see the move coming by Carlos Sastra, and again, it's Denny Menchov coming. I'm a bit surprised to see Sastra try this on a hill which is not that steep, but now look at Denny Menchov here. Cadell Evans can't afford to let the gap open. He's across the gap like a rabbit, and that is another cracked rider from the team there. That's Andy Schleck. And moving up there in fourth position, you can see Alejandro Valverde. Frank Schleck, Fran, uh, Frank Schleck Phil, is just sitting back there waiting for his turn to move. He's watching the aggression. Don't forget, Frank Schleck in the red, white and blue there is only looking for a single second. And let's not forget Alessandro Valverde there in the black. The rider who had such a rough ride in the Pyrenees may be coming back in the Alps. He's right there now. He looks across at Frank Schleck. Uh, Cadell Evans looks across at them both and goes back into the slipstream. He's the leader of the Tour de France. It's up to the others to attack him. And on the left there is the new leader in the King of the Mountains, Cole. And Christian van der Velde still there. No teammates on his side with him. Well, this kind of climb suits the big man from Spain there on the left-hand side, wearing number 31. That is Alejandro Valverde, van der Velde back in contact. Moving up as well there, one of the riders from Uscatel, that's Sammy Sanchez, who was in a little bit of difficulty, but he's recovered. Further up the road, though, we here, Phil, you can see... Pate again, got Pate back to him. ...his comeback to the leader, Egoi Martinez, and Simon Gerrans will not give up. He's around about ten lengths off the back of that group, but he's still dreaming of a stage victory. Well, just coming back here is Andy Sleck has rejoined with a fine effort this young man has got back on. Brother Frank is in second position on the wheel of Valverde. Sanchez has shot over to the right. A while up there, Cadell Evans is just marking his men. He's not made a single attack, and that's the way he must ride this. If they sense he's vulnerable, they'll all hit him. Well, he's got to control, and that's the important thing. You have to control in a situation like this. I don't think Cadell really has to make a move himself until he probably gets to the steep climb of the Alpe d'Huez. But now, coming back, three riders from CSC in this group. Carlos Sastra Phil has attacked on a climb which really doesn't suit him and I wouldn't be surprised to see another move coming from Team CSC in a little bit. Sammy Sanchez now says, you guys can watch each other, I'm going to take off. Well, he's got a chance, but it doesn't look as though they're going to let him go because Frank Schleck has lifted up the pace here. Cole is still there, and Cadell won't move. Samuel Sanchez is not a worry just yet. Watch out, Sastra's moving on the right. Sanchez concentrating, not worried about the other guys. He's trying to move up in the overall standings. He's lost himself a little bit of time since the start of the tour, but he started the day in 11th place overall. He's looking for 4 minutes and 26 seconds, and if they let him go, he could very easily pull back a minute on a stage like this. And that would help to make it look a bit more respectable. They won't react just yet because he's caused a little bit of a diversion here, Samuel Sanchez, for Uscatel Uscardi. And they're looking over the back there. The, meanwhile, let's go back to the front because here is the return of the Australian. Simon Gerrans is back with the two leaders. One American, one Australian and one Spanish rider drive towards the top of an Italian outpost called Prato Nervoso. No Italian. Sanchez is slowly but surely going nowhere. Well, Sanchez is trying to go again, but now with three riders from Team CSC in that group behind, Phil, I have a feeling that... Uh, Andy Schleck is going to sacrifice himself for Frank Schleck in the group Mayo Jaune. Third position there is Bernard Cole. Cadell Evans looks fine this afternoon. He's responded to all of the attacks so far. Van der Velde is the man that's sitting a second from the back of the group. Alongside him is Carlos Sastra. Nine riders at the front in today's uh, main field of the Tour de France. Not all of the top ten riders are here. Sanchez could well improve a couple of places tonight, whatever happens. As we head up to five kilometres to go, three of the four remain together. Martinez has tried twice to get away from these riders. Twice they've hauled him back. He may not have a third in him. 
Well, I'm not sure that he does, and I tell you what, I take my hat off very sincerely to number 199, Danny Pate, who doesn't have the reputation of a climber like Simon Gerrans or Igor Martinez, but he's responded and he's re present and correct all of the time. This now is the yellow jersey group. These are pretty much the heads of state of the Tour de France this year. Sammy Sanchez is slipping backwards. He's back in the group, so we're now 10 as he goes to back. Carlo Sasta doesn't look so good anymore now. Frank Schleck is being set up by his brother at the front of the race uh, to launch him perhaps for the finishing line. Remember, the second is a blink of the eyelid. That's all it is to steal the yellow jersey. He's trying to pick up who the rider was from Liquigas. It's Roman Kruziger, the rider who won the uh, Tour of Switzerland uh, earlier this year, and he's now moved himself uh, up to the heads of state. Yes, you're right. I think uh, Carlos Sastra has hit them very hard on a couple of occasions, and now he's been put into the red zone for a while. He needs to get himself uh, sorted out if he wants to think about trying to attack again. Just look at the acceleration there as we came to a halt with our picture of Alessandro Valverde. He looks across at Bernard Cole, who's turning out to be something of a revelation in this year's Tour de France in that blue jersey. Andy Schleck set in tempo now, trying to get Frank a little bit of a chance to recover. So too his other teammate, Carlos Sastra. So he's got to set the pace. Sanchez has found his legs again, and he comes up alongside Christian van der Velde, who is content at this moment to follow wheels. And I do not believe that van der Velde is in any trouble at all. He might well go near the end. A little bit further down the slope here. This is the man that the majority of is the Italian crowds will be shouting for, Damiano Cuneo. I've absolutely no idea where he is currently, but the fact that he's alongside Sandy Casafa would indicate that he's maybe not at the front end of the race. They've been split on the climb. They're in the second big peloton of the Tour de France right now. Kirken. Yes, and he's losing ground. This is not good for Kim Kirken. He started the day seventh overall. The former yellow jersey is under pressure at the back. He may be losing a few places today. Danny Pate has decided he doesn't want to uh, be subjected to the pacemaking of the two climbers now, so he's felt, felt that the best thing for him to do is come up and set the pacemaking himself. And when you're not maybe the best climber in the group, that's sometimes the best thing to do because you can set a pace which is comfortable for yourself. Well, one thing's for sure, Alessandro Valverde has shed all of his problems with the Pyrenees. He's back in the race in the Alps here. I'm not sure he can make up time lost, but he can take stages. Look at the face of young Andy Schleck. This is the brother Frank. He's just riding till he drops. Well, he's setting a massive big tempo for Team CSC. They really are a phenomenal team. I'm a bit concerned, Phil, about uh, Carlos Sastra sitting second from the back of that group because despite the two magical attacks he put in, he now seems to be in a little bit of difficulty. Three riders at four kilometres to go. Martinez, Danny Pate and Simon Gerrans. And still, you cannot really pick a winner. The group Maillot Jean have halved the deficit. 7.30, they won't get them, though. At four kilometres to go, they won't be that far behind them, though, because the infighting is taking place. Still at the front is Andy, he can't go on much longer. And at uh, second wheel is Valverde, then Bernard Cole, and then Kreuzinger, Frank Schleck, Cadell Evans, Menchoff, Sastra, they're all still there. And the one man you forgot to mention, of course, Christian van der Velde, looking very comfortable. I think this is the kind of climb that suits Christian van der Velde here this afternoon. Evans on his own, but there's only one team that's got a multiple number of riders in there, and that's Team CSC. Van der Velde, 191 at the back, still pedalling very supplely, and he's keeping himself uh, in contact with the yellow jersey. I think uh, when you're a guy like Christian van der Velde, you've got to pick a rider to try and follow. I'm amazed at how well van der Velde is riding in the Tour de France this year, Phil. He really has become the revelation for the United States. If he runs out of these Alps with, with a very close... Uh time loss to the leader, he can win in the time trial, he's very, very quick up front there, the three riders I think have tried their attacks and haven't had an answer, it might go down to the finishing sprint, which of course is very much uphill, as we go back here the rider in the lime green the only thing we're certain about, Paul, in that group, as we look at it, uh, one of them will win the Tour de France in Paris there's nobody else in this race. Absolutely uh, one of those riders in the yellow jersey group which has created this afternoon the first serious selection, but let's not forget after this stage today, Phil there's a rest day and then there's two more vicious days in the Alps and this race can turn upside down on any one of those occasions. The three leaders look at Danny Pate here. Well, he's strong. He is extremely strong. He's riding well 
well and he's riding sensibly. He's waiting for the moves, he's waiting for the accelerations and he decided, he looked at Simon Gerrans and said, well, I'm going to have a go myself and see if I can get rid of the Aussie, but he can't. He lifts the pace, he's forced uh, Simon Gerrans to get out of the saddle and close the gap and he's just checked on him. And uh, sometimes, when you're, if you're feeling strong, you let the rider think he's getting on, you kick again. Martinez uh, has got... down there, yes, and he wasn't looking either, was he, Danny Pate? That wasn't an expense. That could have been an expensive move, but Pate has a lot of strength in these legs. He's going after Martinez. I don't know why he keeps on checking on Gerrans. Gerrans is a fighter. This man knows how to suffer, and he's trying to go back. Meanwhile, our other Tour de France is on the lower slopes, and Andy Sleck is pushing on as he tries to go clear now. Well, Andy Schleck has uh, taken off there because he's seen a little move going clear there, and I think Denny Menshoff... Oh, oh, he's gone down. Oh, what did he hit there? He just slipped on the road. Menshoff was making his big move of the day, Phil, and he went down and his chain is off. Well, he's going to have to get himself back in. Just look at this. He just goes around the corner and it's so slippy. There is no reason for that, I think. And, in fact, I can look out the window here. The rain has just started, can you believe? And it's becoming quite heavy in the last few kilometres. And that was simply the grease on the surface of the road. Well, the riders saw that, but there'll be no waiting now. Phil, that was a scary move by Denny Menshoff. We knew this man was the silent mover, the silent man in the main field waiting for the move. Just looking down to check and see if there's any damage to his bike, and he says, no, it's OK, I've got to get myself back into this event. But you can see now why Denny Menshov has been regarded as a dangerous bike rider. Well, you don't deserve bad luck like that, but the rain has just started. It's just skimmed on the surface of the road here. It's caused a little bit of a regrouping of the boys here as uh, Andy takes over the pacemaking. Brother Frank is down the, in the centre there. Valverde to the right. Cole to the left, Sastra to the back, they are all here. Well, we're still spread by exactly the same time gaps as when we started this race today. There is nothing in it. 57 seconds covers the top five men in the Tour de France. And if they finish like this, there will be no time differences again tonight. Andy Sleck wants Brother Frank to come out and grab a second. Well, there's Kruziger in second position there, another young rider, a star for the future. But Andy Sleck too, I think, Phil, will come back to the Tour de France one year and quite possibly be a winner. There is Damiano Cunego trying to pull himself back into this bike race, but in fact he's losing place. He was with that group there, and I think that is the group of Kim Kirken, and the little prince from Italy is not going to win no. the stage this afternoon, he's and he's just suffering. Him. He's at two and a half kilometres behind the yellow jersey group right now. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he stays in Italy, quite frankly, because he's not uh, firing like we expected. These are the leaders locked in combat for the win as they head up towards the summit of the climb. Still Martinez doing the work. And just who is the strongman of this group? Well, Alejandro Valverde looks concentrated, looks good. That's Kruziger. the secret weapon, Kreuzinger. Yep. He's going to be such a great cyclist. He's going to be a great bike rider. He's lost himself a lot of time in the Tour de France this year, Phil, but it's only a, his first serious attempt. He started the day in 19th place overall. Now another acceleration coming from Andy Schleck saying to them, take this one if you can because I'm going to hurt you men and we're going to hit you again before the summit. This is a rider who was dropped by the group who fought his way back and went straight to the front and stretched them again. And he's put Sanchez in a little bit of trouble with acceleration. Still hanging slightly off his Carla Sastra. He's not riding smoothly, number 11. But Christian van der Velde, he is still following. He's not under pressure. Van der Velde, 191 in the white jersey there of Garmin Chipotle, looking very comfortable. He's alongside Cadell Evans. And uh, right in front of Cadell Evans, uh, Evans is keeping his eye very firmly on the red, white and blue jersey there of Andy Schleck. Well, Frank the, Schleck. Uh, yeah. The people on the side here, the Tifosi of Italy, are watching a yellow jersey really defend himself well on this climb. It's normally a pink jersey as leader of the Giro d'Italia, but not this time. The Tour's making its first to climb up here. The face of Andy Schleck, he's been superb. Kreuzinger just licking his lips behind and is in no pressure at all. He's only 23 as well. Well, at two kilometres to go, Phil, there are still three men in contact for the victory this afternoon. Danny Pate is trying to get the win for the United States of America. He looks across at Egoi Martinez to say, how are your legs, my mate? Can I beat you to the summit? 
in the yellow jersey group, though, they've got rid, I think, finally, of Sammy Sanchez, and there's another acceleration at the front. And look at the back here, because Cadell Evans has got to grit his teeth right now. That is a very serious push by Menchov. That has hurt Cadell Evans, but he, fr he struggles and fights. He's looked over his shoulder, Menchov. He's seen the yellow in trouble, but he knows it's all coming back together again. Well, that was a serious acceleration by Menchov, and I'm not so a little bit surprised as to why he sat up, but it's allowed Cadell Evans to get himself back into this race. Bernard Cole there comes to the front, and he's now going to look for the acceleration, and that is a move that they need to respond to. Well, we're looking at the real race to lead the Tour de France here. That is why our cameras are staying away from the men who are out to win the stage. We'll cut back by the time those riders get up the top. And right now, Cadell Evans and Frank Schleck, the two men likely to succeed, are both in a little bit of trouble. The man who nailed back Bernard Cole there, in fact, was Alejandro Valverde. Now, that goes to show that Valverde is recovering as this race goes further forward. Sitting on the wheel of the yellow jersey now is Frank Schleck and again the acceleration coming out the front and this time again it's Denny Menshoff and I think this time it's curtains for Andy Schleck so they've lost the pacemaker Cadell is on the whip end here he's being flicked around at the back of this line Menshoff is advertising to everybody he's got the legs now uh, but uh, Alessandro Valverde is simply superb and on the outside now a little move to just go to the head of the race did you say that Andy Schleck was gone well like excuse me he's just come back and he's thinking about brother Frank, he's thinking about Carlos Sastra. This is an unbelievable team. Kim Sirkin trying to get back up into, on, into competition here. He's around about a minute in yeah. arrears off the back end of the yellow jersey group. There is Efim Kin, he's been dislodged. Cyril Dissell is in this group as well. Sandy Kassar just getting onto the back there as well. That looks like Fofanov. It is uh, Dimitri Fofanov. They are fighting, though, a little way down here. This is a, a duo battle. We'd like to see what's happening with the leaders. We're, of course, in the hands of our French direction here. We don't know of anything that's going on up front at the moment, but we will see them cross the line, I'm sure about that. We're looking here at the battle for the next wearer of the yellow jersey, nodding like the dog in the proverbial car window. Bernard Cole is trying again to answer, where does Andy Schleck get this from? Well, he gets it from the fact, Phil, that he was a, yeah, he was a white jersey winner of the Giro d'Italia last year, second overall, he's got the ability to climb, he's hit them and hit them again, and he's trying to set something up, and look at this, Frank Schleck has seen the move now, and as soon as Frank Schleck gets to the wheel of his brother, he accelerates, but Cadell Evans is pinned to the back wheel of the man who is one second ahead of behind him in the overall classification. Well, this is the group that's racing approximately six minutes behind the leaders, let us not forget that, but Coming up to one kilometre to go, there they are. These are the three leaders of the day today. None will pull on the yellow jersey tonight. There is the kite for them, and Danny Pate is going to take them to the kite. The man who has looked completely fried for 100 kilometres seems to be extremely strong indeed. We are looking now further down the slopes, and this is another attack by Sastra. Carlos Sastra is looking for the climb this afternoon. He's just about to get joined there, Phil, by Denny Menchov, covered as well by Bernard Cole. This man wants to win the Tour de France this year. He's put everything into the bank to try and win if he can. Finally, Andy Schleck goes to the back of the group, and they're having to put Cadell Evans onto the front. Evans is now Valverde's in the defensive. Gone. That's it, and he won't chase Valverde because Valverde's lost time. Now Cadell is looking for wheels. He's seen Frank Schleck go. He's got to chase Frank. One second splits them. Cadell Evans gets in the wheel there of Christian van der Velde. What a race this has been, Phil, and this is only the first of the Alpine stages. Look at the face here on Denny Menshoff. He's trying to ride himself back into a top three position at the end of the day. Carlos Sastre is the man that set it up, but I tell you what, CSC are all over this race. Roman Kreutziger is the man now setting the pace ahead of Frank Schleck, and Cadell Evans is just pulling himself back into this. The they have thrown margin. everything at him this afternoon. This has been a very tough time. There's a one-second gap there right now. My opinion is Cadell should lose this yellow jersey and give it to Frank Schleck and live to fight another day. We've now seen Menchoff is right into the red zone as well as he gets up behind Sastra. Sastra, he's the odd man out of the favourites. He needs some time gain now to start the long journey back. He can't ride the last time trial.
Well, Cadell Evans well. now is pretty much on the defensive, and again, Christian van der Velde says, I'm going to go now, a lot of you can follow me if you can. Well, there's some of the crowd up here on the finishing line as the three leaders head up towards the finish. No decision. Danny Pate of Garmin Chipotle zigzagging across the road. Here comes the chase behind again. Menchov, Cole, Sastra. Watch out, Valverde is creeping up. We've split it four and four here at the moment, and Christian van der Velde might be the saviour of Cadell Evans today. He may well be. I think if you remember back to uh, the climb up to Otakam, he was the saviour of Cadell Evans on that occasion too. Bernard Cole now comes out, uh, nodding that head of his in that strange gangly style to lift the pace once more. He's looking to improve on his fourth place overall at the start of the day, and he's not really looking for very much on Christian van der Velde. They come up, they're about a kilometre and a half behind the leaders of the race on the road today. That's how much they've closed up on what has become a totally personal battle between between six or seven men. The face of Sastra here. Every one of these riders today have dug into depths I doubt they ever knew they had. Well, I tell you what, Phil, this is announcing that the next two days in the Alps are going to be very scary for the top ten riders in the overall classification. Carlos Sastra has given his everything this afternoon, but we are not surprised to see the man in orange there, Denny Menchov, the Russian rider wearing 131. Cadell Evans finding some help here and assistance at the finish. Starts. Danny Page broken, but look at the speed of Simon Gerrans. The Australian has left them all. They should have dropped him because this is going to give Australia a terrific stage winners. A chase home by Martinez. A win for Simon Gerrans after four tours to France. He snatches the first ever victory, and that is absolutely delightful from the man from Mansfield in the state of Victoria. And a terrific result for Danny Page an all-day breakaway and the USA rider gets third well that was a brilliant performance by Simon Gerrans after all Phil he was dropped at the start of the day climbed his way back into the leading group of three and came up with a sprint now it looks to me as if uh, Cadell Evans has been on the ground here this afternoon because you can see a little bit of dirt on his elbows there is Christian van der Velde just trying and fighting to stay in contact. They're getting some assistance here, finally, from the pacemaking that's being done by Sammy Sanchez. Well, they've thrown everything at one another, and they're almost neutralised here. Sammy Sanchez is trying to get up to them and help them out. Bernard Cole, Denny Menchov, Sastra and Valverde. None of them will affect the, date, the race destination tonight, but they're closing the gaps on Evans. He will note that. Well, Bernard Cole in the blue jersey there, gone. Phil, is looking for 46 seconds. That's all he requires at the end of today. And he's got with him the man who is just behind him in the overall classification, Denny Menshoff. I'm not surprised to see now a little bit of backing off there by Andy Schleck. He's done a great job. Christian van der Velde still in contact here. First, second and third in the overall classification at the start of the day. But now it's Roman Kruziger who's setting the pacemaking there for Cadell Evans. Still in the yellow jersey. Five riders at one kilometre to go now. The race is on to see who will be the next wearer of the Mayo Jean. Carlos Sastra has to take time in the, in the Alps. He has to. And uh, Valverde has to take lots of time, but he wanted to do well. He wanted to prove a point today. He's the Spanish champion. Alejandro Valverde will ride himself uh, possibly back into the top ten at the end of the Tour de France stage this afternoon, and he's got with him Denny Menchoff. Phil, this is a great battle here, and there is the yellow jersey trying to keep it on his shoulders, and I'm looking at my clock here. He's already lost himself under the red kite, Phil, 33 seconds. So he's only just holding on to the yellow jersey ahead of Bernard Cole. Well, my opinion, it'd be better if Cole took it away from him and took off a little bit of the pressure here, because the men that he really fears, I think, are around him, with the exception of Menchov, who is gaining time, and there goes Cole again, and this could be for the yellow jersey. Well, Cole knows this, Phil. He knows he is so close to the yellow jersey here this afternoon. He's looking for 46 seconds. That's all he wants. He doesn't care about finishing fifth or sixth or seventh on a stage like this. And look at Carlos Sastra. He, too, is pulling himself back up there. And Alejandro Valverde is riding like the true Spanish champion that he is this afternoon. Well, Carlos Sastra is 1 minute 28 behind Cadell Evans. He needs time, and he started to get it by the look of it. 500 metres to go. Cole surely must realise now he could be a yellow jersey wearing the Tour de France. That has never happened to him before. Don't, don't worry about the time count because that is the time on Simon Gerrans, who's been home for three minutes. Cole, Sastra, Valverde's tracking a little bit.
Well, Cole gets out of the saddle again, Phil, over this final steep part of the climb. He doesn't have to worry about what position he's going to be this afternoon. He has to worry about the clock and what the clock is going to tell him. And once he's crossed the line, start your clock and try and count for 46 seconds because that's what it's all going to be about at the end of the day. Has Cadell Evans and the group behind got any power left to try and pull back the gap that well, he had? Menchoff has been placed in serious trouble here and might go back to the Cadell Evans group because Bernard Cole, who's threatened to do something, he is the, most certainly now the new leader of the King of the Mountains, and the clock may also make him the new leader of the Tour de France. He's going all the way to the line. It is a case of every second counts, and Sastre is also gaining time. This race today has not opened up. It is completely closed down. We are still talking about a matter of seconds, and now 44 will do. 49, it's going to have to be. There is Alejandro Valverde going in. Look at the clock at the bottom there. It's 4 minutes and 13 seconds. Cadell Evans has to cross the line, Phil, inside of 4 minutes and 49 seconds if he's going to keep the yellow jersey. Yeah. Here is Menchov. He's been tailed off as well on the run-up towards the finish. Cadell Evans now in the yellow jersey is battling to keep that yellow jersey on his shoulders. He has, he has gone, and he only needs a second over the yellow jersey, and that is a second at least there. Cadell Evans knows he's fighting now to keep yellow and it's a desperate moment Schleck crosses the line well the second's gone now so there's certainly a new leader in the Tour de France and you know Cadell Evans could well be sitting tonight in third place behind Bernard Cole as well